and then it's turned in. Lorenzo Pellegrini proves that he can still lead this side, lead Roma in the big matches and produce the biggest of goal. Hello, hello and welcome back to another episode of Serie A Spotlight. This is episode 105 and we are your hosts Matt and Jake. And here it is. Merry Christmas. Christmas We're late. Yes. And we didn't wish you a happy Christmas in the last one, so we apologize for that. I mean, it wasn't Christmas yet. No way, but I guess uh, you're right, actually. We can't, can't anticipate when we're going to record during the, the busy holidays. Plus, you know that you and I... We we both don't really like planning, right? No, we hate planning. We're very sporadic. In fact, if you notice, three seasons of Serie A Spotlight and the release date of each episode is different every week. Well, come on. <laughs> we, we stick to Tuesday, Wednesday yeah. when it comes to recording as early as we can, I guess. Between Monday and Thursday, I would say the episodes <laughs> come out. Well, um, Merry Christmas to all of you listening. Have a happy new year, just so that we can anticipate that and not be mm-hmm. not be late again. Thank you for sticking around this year, and we look forward to dishing out content for you throughout 2024. Yes, stay tuned. Keep those eyes. Keep those eyes. Keep those eyes nice and peeled. Eyes yes. nice. Eyes spice. Yes. Also, um, we didn't have a break this yeah. year, so apologies that this episode is significantly late because you will be listening to this on Friday, the day of some other Serie A fixtures, but mm. it'll serve as a nice reminder of what happened um, while, you know, you were missing football because you were having lunch here, dinner there, drinks yeah. there, so consider this a nice it'll reminder. get you in the zone. Serie A during Christmas time is not something we're used to. Uh, usually there's a break. It's yeah, really yeah. Two a weeks. little bit weird, yes. Our goal of the week came from Pellegrini. You know, vindication. Very tight. Thy name is Lorenzo. Ashbin. What do you say? <laughs> <laughs> it had been a while, a long time coming for Pellegrini. He had fallen out of favor. He was at one point one of Italy's best midfielders um, and Roma's captain. At one point, he lost yeah. the armband. He lost the starting spot, and he became more of a kind of rotation player. Um, coming off the bench in well, most games. Well, he had been injured for a while. He as did. Well. He has struggled with injuries in his career, but this was a nice. Um, confidence boost for him scoring on the on the volley like that. We had yeah. a few close contenders for second place. Um, Barella, Gildes, and Illich I thought scored fantastic goals. Do you think Illich's goal was intentional? Uh, no, you could literally see him looking inside the box <laughs> yeah. and seeing how he's gonna ping it. Now I don't care. I thought it was a magnificent goal nonetheless. I don't care what you were trying to do. The ball left your foot and hit the back of the net. The keeper was rooted to the spot. It was beautiful. Um, I do think that when it comes to team play, um, Barella's goal was was extraordinary. It was incredible. The, incredible. He played the ball to um, uh, Arnautovic himself. Arnautovic at his back towards goal. That give and go is delicious. That back heel by Arnautovic back to Barella rounds the keeper. Then Yildiz as well on his um, debut. I believe. Yes, his uh, first start for Juventus, Montella, Vincenzo Montella, yes, the Vincenzo Montella, hmm. you remember him at Fiorentina and at Milan, um, gave him a few starts for Turkey, actually. Yildiz has been quite instrumental for this for the Turkey national team. So it's clear to see why the guy is so calm under pressure, um, floating between three players and then finishing so calmly and intelligently at the near post. Um, that was a very mature goal. Yeah, Juve uh, have got a bunch of talented young wingers, don't they? Now with uh, Sule probably returning uh, next year to Juve. I don't think they need Mimmo anymore, bro. Yeah, I don't think they need Allegri anymore. To be <laughs> go, go for a proactive approach. You've got the talent, definitely. <laughs> so don't forget to like, follow, rate, date, chat the lot. Um, thank you for giving us five stars on Spotify. If you could help by continuing to give us five stars on Spotify, that would be great. And don't forget us on YouTube. We're very late on the train, so we're lacking subscribers. Yes. We're lacking views over there. Give us a helping hand. Share it, like it, do whatever you can. We've got 70 followers on YouTube. That's 70 subscribers. More than I thought it would yeah. have, to be honest. <laughs> Which means you're in time to be one of the first 100 YouTube subscribers to Serie A Spotlight. So yeah, get on the bandwagon, guys. We won't forget you. <laughs> Um, Shout out to our patrons, we've got Patreon as well, and these are, we've rebranded the Patreon, and they are no longer called the Serie A Spotlight family, but now we call them, 3 to 1, 
the spotheads. Spot okay. So if you would like to become a spothead, it's just three ninety nine a month, and you get added to the group chat with the rest of the spotheads. Yeah, we yeah. won't stop calling them the spotheads until we get Cerave as a sponsor. Once exactly. we get Cerave as a sponsor, we'll stop. So shout out to our spotheads. We've got Edward. We've got Alan. Andy. Lena. Jose. Mintoff, Mike, Matteo, Matthias, Luca, Anthony, Michael, David, Kyle, Andrew, and Sluge McNoodle, baby. Sluge McNoodle. Apparently his name is Roy Redding. Roy Redding, that's but such a never, cool name. He never actually reached out to be in the group chat. Roy, if you're listening, do send that message. I sent you the number on, on the Patreon app. Um, do join, it's fun, yeah, it's, it's fun. good fun. It's very fun. He seems to be Australian as well, nice, nice. Oh, we've, we've got a bunch of Aussies we've now, that's David a third well. Aussie. Yeah, David and Anthony as well. Yeah, there you go. All right, very good, guys. Before we get into the rundown, I believe um, we should update our listeners, bro, a little bit on what's been going on in the Coppa Italia ah, and yes, what of is course. next. So the round of 16 of the Coppa Italia has commenced. Lazio beat Genoa 1-0 to go through. Um, Fiorentina and Parma drew to all. But Fiorentina absolutely demolished them on penalties, 4-1. Yep. Um, Napoli lost to Frosinone. Those who are listening to our last episode would have heard our live reaction to seeing that score on our phones. Um, Frosinone smashed them 4-0 after De Laurentiis said that um, it's not fair that Frosinone get to compete in Serie A with all those big-name clubs. Um, mm. That's a... That's nice uh, revenge by Frosinone. Yeah. And Bologna beat Inter away from home 2-1 yep. uh, to advance to the quarterfinals. Now that leaves Milan. They need to face Cagliari. Atalanta need to face Sassuolo. Roma need to face Cremonese. And Juve need to face Salernitana. And then we can move on to the quarterfinals of the Coppa Italia. Yep. And then we've got the, the latter stages of the Coppa Italia, which are always so fun to to tune into midweek. Um as for the rundown, in order of the games that we're going to be covering to cover match day 17, we'll start things off with the very violent derby del Sole, where Roma got away against Napoli with a 2-0 victory. Not many people know it's a derby, but it's essentially the centre of Italy against the south of Italy. We make derbies out of nothing in Italy. Inter 2, Lecce 0, Inter maintaining that 4 point advantage over Juve however Juve did get past Frosinone away from home with the score of 2-1 where they were momentarily just one point behind Inter Salernitana 2 Milan 2 Pippon Zaghi's return to face his former side um, ended with an upset for for Milan and a good result for Salernitana a rare Mike Mandian mistake made that possible for Salernitana Bologna 1 Atalanta 0 was it against the run of play perhaps but Big teams win games that perhaps they don't deserve to win. Monza nil, Fiorentina one. Another goalkeeping error over here by this time by Di Gregori. Another unchar- uncharacteristical error gave Fiorentina the lead through a Beltran goal. Empoli nil, Lazio two. Clean victory over there by Lazio away from home. Sassuolo one, Genoa two. I found a stat recently that said Sassuolo have conceded in every single game that they've played so far. This time, um, mm-hmm. Caleb Ekuban scored a goal here for Genoa, getting his first of the season. Verona 2, Cagliari 0. Cagliari were doing well until they got a red card. And Torino 1, Udinese 1. That was where Illich went across the ball, but the ball hit the back of the net. Brilliant rundown, bro. Sporadic, natural, amazing. Um, I think we can jump in and start with the Derby del Sole. The yes, Della sir. Sole or Del Sole? What is I'm it? pretty sure it's Del Sole. Okay, okay. Let's just call it Romanopoly. Okay? <laughs> yeah, let's and do that. Romanopoly actually ended 2-0 to Roma, who are much stronger at home than they are away from home. Of course, this is a historical thing with Roma, considering the nature of the Olimpico and the nature of their fan base and their songs. You know, it always gives them that extra push. Yeah. For absentees, of course, Roma were missing Abraham, Awar, Debala, Kumbulla, and Smalling, the usual suspects, quite yep. frankly. While Napoli were missing Elmas, Lindstrom, and Oliveira to injury. Elmas, of course, has recently been um, confirmed to believing he's going to Leipzig in Germany. Yep. Um, yeah, and that makes Zelinski also who's, who might be leaving in January, heading to winter. These are talking points for later, of course. So let's go through the lineups because this was a, quite the clash of the Titans, okay? Um, the underperforming Titans. <laughs> Rui Patricio was in goal for Roma, while Mancini, Lorente, and Indica were at the back. Christensen was on the right and Zalewski on the left with um, Cristante, Paredes, and Bove in the middle. Lukaku and Bellotti started up front together. <clears throat> 
this Roma side was basically designed to go to war. Yeah. That's what they played players who would literally make it a nightmare for Napoli physically and mentally. Yeah. Now, um, Napoli, on the other hand, lined up with a 4-3-3 formation with Meret in goal, Mario Rui out on the left, De Lorenzo on the right, with Juan Jesus and Rahmani at the back. Weird. Zielinski, Lobotka and Anguissa were in midfield with Gvaratskeli out on the left, Oziman up front and Politano out on the right. So yes, as I mentioned, you could see this match and deem it to be a battle between two struggling sides coming into the game. Napoli were two points ahead of Roma in sixth. Roma proved to be the more streets, streetwise um, team, dictating the tempo of the match and frustrating their opponents to the point of expulsion. Um, and they started from the get-go. You get to see in the 30th minute, um, Mourinho grabbed the face of Gvarat Skelia, last yeah. season's MVP, and shouted, basta, 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 mm. grabbed his face, went close to him. He literally got into his head like early yeah. on in the first half. And that pretty much set the tone for the entire game. Napoli were shown two red cards at the end of the game <laughs> out of sheer frustration. One to Politano and one to Victor Oziman. Um, yeah, let's just go through a quick a quick summary, okay, of how things how things played through. Yeah. So Roma started off on the front foot, surprisingly enough, showcasing relentless pressure. Okay, I was particularly impressed with Bove throughout the whole game, but particularly his start. He struck the post and then forced Meret into a great save after Bellotti had pl- put it on a plate for him pretty mm-hmm. much. And that was a good save because that was a tap-in for Bove. Yeah. Okay. Um, Napoli struggled to create in the first half. In general, their best chance came through an Ozyman bicycle kick from a corner um, that went to in- that led to the path of Anguissa, but the Cameroonian failed to connect with it. Napoli started the second half with um, improved attacking intent through Zielinski and Gvaretskelia, but really failed to trouble Rui Patricio significantly. The first red card was shown to a very frustrated Matteo Politano for violent conduct after having his shirt pulled by Zalewski on a counter-attack and he decided to kick him. He lunged at him. It wasn't a crazy kick, it didn't hurt him or anything, but the fact that he lashed out at his opponent meant uh, an immediate, yes, immediate yeah. red card. Pellegrini scored a sensational volley just 10 minutes later. This would be the 76th minute after a sequence of blocked and mishit shots. In the 83rd minute, Lukaku attempted to chip Meret after being played through brilliantly by Cristante, but Meret pulled off another great save. And 10 minutes after the opener, Oziman was shown his second yellow card. Um, yeah, for for a clumsy challenge, to be honest, uh, the Roma man did make a bit of a meal out of it, but um, but it was still yeah, it's it was a, still second a second yellow, yellow you, know, you know, not a straight red. Roma had clearly managed to get under Napoli's skin in typical Mourinho fashion. Lukaku linked up with Indica at the end. Uh, it wasn't all that pretty by Indica, but he got the ball to Lukaku, who fainted, took another touch and sealed the deal in the 96th minute while Napoli's eight remaining outfield players <laughs> were trying to find an equalizer. Bro, what a game. Oh, amazing game. Amazing game. This is a, a, a classic Roma victory. Um, it's not often that we see Roma beat other teams in the top seven. Um, but when they do, this is exactly how they do it. They go to war. Yeah, you know, yeah, absolutely. If, if there's one thing Mourinho likes to do, you see him as well in the Europa League final, for example. The second he's not a, a favorite in the game, that's the style of play he likes to take. He knows that his team possibly performs better when it's a scrap. Mm-hmm. When it's a scrap, a lot of these players come out to play. And I think Napoli play worse when it's a scrap. And, and as champions, um, with perhaps a a bruised ego at the moment, they could get frustrated. And that's exactly what they did. They frustrated them. You see Mourinho in the beginning, like you said, going straight to the MVP and getting in his head. And and that led to, you know, all right, Roma got a bunch of yellow cards themselves, but Napoli lost this game. And now they're missing Politano and Victor Osimhen for the next game. So yeah. Roma have done some serious, serious damage to Napoli over here. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, I was particularly impressed by the approach of as Roma, part- you know, just fielding as many physical players as, as possible. You know, you look at that midfield, it's it's rough. Yeah. And, and Bellotti and Lukaku up front, they're going to do a lot of pressing for you. Mm-hmm. You know, but uh, an interesting statistic I saw was that Roma had 19 fouls. Wow. Well, Napoli had 12. Roma had seven yellow cards. Napoli had four. Yet, 
Roma finish with 11 men and two goals, while Napoli finish with nine men and zero goals. So yeah. that's just that's just tactical fouls yeah, yeah. versus frustrated fouls. It's, it, it was all part of the game plan, and yeah. it just goes to show because Roma are just as frustrated as a side as Napoli are mm-hmm. with the way things are going this season. But this game. Roma showed that they have a certain level of maturity that perhaps the defending champions don't have. And as you mentioned, they've got a bruised ego at the moment. Yeah. So maybe they weren't willing to to scrap it out with, with Roma the same way that Roma were willing to do so. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. Um, and as well, Roma just have continuity on their side at the moment, no? You look at Napoli, this is their second manager this season. Yeah. Um, <laughs> third manager in... Six months when you when true you look actually at it, well. when you look at it that way um, after the highs of last season now they're facing a reality where look the competition has increased you've got Juve you've got Inter you've got all these guys that have really stepped up this season and they're in a spot where they're weaker and this was essentially um, if you look at I believe a couple of match days ago um, these teams are essentially fighting for that fourth spot so the derby del Sole this year carries a bit more importance to it than it has previously. And Roma went prepared. They went prepared. They're like, this means a lot. We need that fourth spot. Um, they haven't gotten Champions League under Mourinho yet since he's been there. This is his third fucking season. There's no fucking around. We're yeah. going to get a game like this. We're going to throw our bodies on the line. We're going to press to oblivion. I was... It, it, it's almost a blessing in disguise that uh, I might say something crazy here that the ball was out of this game, not because Bellotti has more quality or because he plays better, but for the press, mm-hmm. Bellotti is excellent at pressing. Yeah, he doesn't yeah. stop running, El Gallo. Yeah, um, it, the way things panned out, yes, it could be deemed that way, of course. Um, it, it's just fortunate for them that they managed to get that red card because I don't think without, I don't think that they could have scored had it not been for the red card and in fact that's when they capitalize and when they really started to get close like granted Bove hit the post early on mm-hmm. and then um, Belotti set up Bove also in the first half but you know how it, g- it gets with Mourinho yeah. um, in the second half especially he tends to settle um, yeah. for for a draw but yes bro absolutely um, I was very impressed with Bove at this game he Bove won game, man. he won most of his duels be them on the ground be them in the air he, he showed solid defensive um, attributes mm. while also good offensive flair as well I was I was very impressed by him yeah he was he was pretty much everywhere man um, he had just some statistics for you over here uh, he had a 75% pass success rate he had 39 touches of the ball but I don't think uh, most of his good performance could be deemed by when he had possession of the ball mm. because he was so good off the ball yeah, well, yeah absolutely man. Yeah, very intelligent player. Um, he's only 21 years old, you know. He's been playing with Roma for his entire life <laughs> since yeah. his youth career. You know, he's already got 47 appearances and two goals. So, mm-hmm. good on you, Eduardo Bove. Mm-hmm. I thought Mario Rui was bad. Ah, not not his game. best game at all. Um, it's almost... It, it, he's at a, a bit of an awkward point in his career, Mario Rui. He was doing so well under Spalletti and I feel like the attacking Liberty and the... The freedom to cross and to attack and to advance mm-hmm. um, with midfield coverage was was suiting him really well. Yeah. But the more defensive responsibility you give to Mario Rui, the worse he's going to perform. I mean, he was so good for the past few seasons. And think about it. For the past few seasons, he had had um, Kim Min Jae last season. Mm-hmm. And before that, he had Koulibaly covering for him. Very good point. So he almost afforded to go forward and be that DeMarco style um left back but now the second that he goes up with Juan Jesus and Rahmani starting alongside each other that that's not a solid defense you know what I mean so yeah. the second he goes up they're left exposed um, and it's almost like he's unsure of his responsibilities should I be going forward should I be staying back he was often caught in no man's land I genuinely believe that for the system um, Oliveira is probably a, a better fit in a flat four at the back yeah, yeah, um, probably. What you get with Mario Rui and then is the the corners, set pieces, the crossing prowess. He has um, a very good understanding with Victor Oziman, of course, but just not the way they're lining up. That yeah. flat back four barely advances. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah, so for me, it was a clear, a clearly deserved victory for Roma. 
Yeah, I think so. They they did what they had to do, albeit yeah. it, it, it's not a, a, a sexy way to win a game the way that they did it. That's how, that, that, that's what Roma had to do and that's what they did. Eh? But it's different, you know. We often see teams blow other teams out of the water or we see teams scrap, but this was a psychological battle that Roma fought and it, yeah. and they and they won it um, and it worked to a T. Mm. It was, it was a masterclass. Like, and it's not like they, they lost a bunch of players uh, due to suspension over there because Napoli are the ones, it's the losers that are facing the, the suspension so are going to be weakened for the next game. They racked up a couple of yellows, but there are worse things in the world, man. Absolutely. Like hunger, for yeah. example. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and Mourinho's masterclass is the reason why I've chosen him for our episode artwork. Um, if you're wondering where those come from, I draw the, those myself. And you can buy them from the shop. If you're a patron, they're free. You can download all of them. Um, if you're not, they only cost three euros. So feel yeah. free to go and get yourself a, a nice desktop background or a print, you know. Yeah. Okay, I should be back. Sorry if, if you guys couldn't hear me too clearly. There was a bit of a, a technical issue with my mic. <laughs> Not quite sure what happened, but hopefully it won't persist. Yeah. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about, brother, is um, Napoli's moves in the January transfer. Aha, uh-huh, because right? it, it's slightly, it, it looks like they don't have a plan and they're just offloading anyone uh-huh. that they can. So Elmas is off to Leipzig. Yes. And Zelensky is probably off to Inter. They're going to try to push to make it happen in January. They being Inter, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, they but will he manage. should be. Uh, I, I highly doubt that they'd be mad to let him go to Inter. In, uh, in January. In January, yeah. I uh, mean, well, firstly, they'll need to pay because his contract won't be up. Um, mm-hmm. And we saw what happened with the Samardzic deal, for example. We know Inter are in debt. They they can't do it. It it'll be bizarre yeah. if they if they manage to pull that off. And claims of bankruptcy being imminent uh, for Inter. It's like one hundred and eighty one million or something. This news comes out every year. They always manage to wiggle out of it. I'm not quite sure about the details of it, of course. But mm. we'll we'll stay tuned. Tuned. We'll read and we'll try uh-huh. to share as much knowledge as possible. With it's you guys. it's weird that like Zielinski and Elmas because. <laughs> they're the only two players they have playing that role like the like the the uh, trek artista role almost. yeah kind of a free role right even though elmas mm. um, was deployed as a kind of vice guevara for a lot it's not really his natural position no. you know um absolutely yes and inter really could use some midfield reinforcement mm-hmm. um so Zelensky would be would be quite nice for oh, it fit nicely it fit incredibly there i think mm-hmm. Um, even though he's not been great this season, so no, he's, no, <laughs> leaves a lot to be. He kind of does this vanishing acting games at times. Yeah, um, Zanoli, the substitute right back of Di Lorenzo, is off to Genoa on loan, a very good coup for Genoa. Mm-hmm. Um, but he, he was on loan missed. last year. Who, who was he on loan at last year? Zanoli? Zanoli was at I want to say Sampdoria, he was their only shining light, remember? yes, yes. Yeah. At the latter stages, he had gotten a few goals, I believe, yeah, as well. And, and I believe uh, there was one incredible assist where, like, saying that the only positive right now on the Sampdoria mm. side is Zanoli. Um, Faroni should be coming in to replace him if all goes as planned. For that, that's good, that's good. Yeah. And then Faroni should get the fuck out of there, yeah. get out of that get sinking, of the sinking ship. ship. Yeah, instead of you know leading the team as he was and has been the captain this entire time. But yeah, yeah I, I got I got a, a gentle reminder on on TikTok about how. Um, was it? It was Faroni who, who cleared the ball off the line with his, with his hand, hand yeah. in the uh, derby. Yeah. So in the derby, uh, in the pl- in the relegation playoff, and then in Zola missed the penalty. Montepo saved it. That was yeah. fucking nuts. Incredible man. He sunk them on his own with that. Yeah. And then in Zola missed the penalty. Of course, I went to Fiorentina. <laughs> 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 what what a leader! <laughs> uh, there is also ah yes, so Ozyman might be going to Afcon. Do you think they should buy a striker as well, or look? Well, they've, they've, they've got Diego Simeone. I feel like they're in decent hands with him. Yeah, yeah. he's a good striker. Raspador, if he wants to play there, he's looked really really good this year. Um, I don't think they'd be in desperate need for one. No. Yeah. Um, the problem is the the offensive plan, right? I mean, Simeone and Raspadori might not thrive um, as there's no system to feed Simeone, for example. But as, as we mentioned and highlighted every single episode, that it relies a lot on individual mm. um, effort to for, for Napoli to actually create attacks. So maybe it's not ideal for Simeone, who thrived when he had the entire Hellas Verona squad feeding him. The entire mm. team was playing for him. Um, so so we'll see what happens there. They'll definitely miss Ozyman because he's the type of striker who can make something out of nothing very quickly. Yeah. Very yeah. easily. 
Um, yeah, when it comes to Roma, by the way, um, they're looking at names to replace Indica during AFCON. Indica nowadays represents the Ivory Coast. He used to represent France. Mm. Um, Bonnetri and Demiral are the names being mentioned. I think that one is clearly better than the other. Yeah, personally. Demiral. Demiral, of course. I mean, they're, they're both not incredibly solid. I mean, Demiral is good, but he, he he's inconsistent with his fitness yeah. and he's currently playing in Saudi. Yeah. Which lets, lets <laughs> well, it I, makes I, you worse. It, when, when you're playing in a in a league of lower quality, it makes you a worse player. But is it even a league of lower quality at this point when you look at the players who are playing? Yes. There, there, there are five, six teams, yeah. let's say five teams that, that have a couple of superstars, you know? Yeah. Their training facilities are still what they are. Their, their other oppositions, remember, there are 15 other teams. They're still yeah. what they are. No, of course, of course, absolutely. It is... Um lower quality football um, however he hasn't been there for very long so mm. it's not like he's been there for three years you know kind yeah. of let himself go he's only been there uh, for I think it's less than a season mm. but yeah I think the morale could be a, a good um, card for Mourinho to, to whip out um, Bonucci's leadership skills of course could be useful as well we'll see what, what route they go down um, both of them have their pros and their cons right yeah the yeah. morale of course his fitness being the main the main con but yeah, bro, I think that's it. Um, as it we, when it comes to the <laughs> standings, Roma are currently in 6th with 28 points, while Napoli are in 7th with 27 points, as Roma leapfrog their rivals. Yes, sir. Inter 2, Lecce nil. We should speak about that now. Um, so Inter responded to Juve's earlier win against Frosinone, maintain, maintaining the 4-point gap at the top. Uh, Inter were aiming to forget the midweek elimination from Coppa Italia against Bologna after losing 2-1 uh, after extra time. Lecce had Almqvist injured, Pongracic was doubtful, but he started the match. Um, injured or suspended players for Inter included Lautaro Martinez, which is probably the biggest loss they could have in their team. Um, Dumfries, DeMarco and Quadrado, so Carlos Augusto started on the left and Arnautovic started alongside Ram, who we were discussing in the earlier episode, who should start? Um, is it going to be Arnautovic or Sanchez? Arnautovic or Sanchez, but Arnautovic yeah. clearly was was preferred over here. Um, in the tenth minute, Mkhitaryan set up Arnautovic nicely with a square pass into the box, but Arnautovic was denied by Falco and F from just six yards out. Should have done better over there. Inter had a stunning passage of attacking play in the 21st minute with slick and sexy football being showcased outside the opposition area. But unfortunately for them, Arnautovic finishing touch straight just wide. Another miss for Arnautovic over there. In the 40th minute, Bissex volley from Chalnoglu's accurate cross stuck the woodwork. Um, but then, just two minutes later, this time, the Chalnoglu-Bissex combination ended with a goal. The centre-back heading in an in-swinger free kick cross from Chalnoglu. In the 50th minute, just after halftime, referee Matteo Marcenaro awarded a bizarre penalty to Lecce, which was quickly shut down by VAR, which showcased no handball by Augusto and that the ball just struck his back. There was absolutely zero yeah. contact with the arm, which was, by the way, against the body. So I really don't know what Matteo Marcenaro saw over there. And I don't know why he had to go to the VAR screen to confirm that there was no contact. Because I'm sure through this walkie-talkie fucking system that they have, they could have said, listen, like, you're wrong. Like, <laughs> you really yeah, don't that, that was see quite it. a clear mistake. It's true. I don't know why they didn't just give the instructions from above. Just being like, hey, listen, I didn't touch his hand. I guess because the referee made the call, he'll have to revert it himself. Yeah. Perhaps, perhaps. It's not like an offside, you know, where there's the, the whole mathematics and the, the whole yeah. line behind it. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in case he's corrupt. Uh, <laughs> in the 77th minute, Inter sealed the deal with a great team goal. Barella played the ball forward to Arnautovic, who with his back towards goal, back heeled the ball back to Barella, who made a very clever run and finished cleanly by rounding the keeper. The team celebrated with Arnautovic for his sublime assist after a tough day at the office for the veteran striker who's yet to open his account despite various opportunities in this match. Mm. In the 83rd minute, Lecce went down to 10 men uh, when Lamek Banda was shown a red card for descent, a straight red card, so I can only imagine what he said. And in the 87th minute, Falcone produced two miraculous saves, the first to deny Pavard at the far post and the second from a follow-up attempt by Aslani from some serious distance with the keeper tipping mm -hmm. the ball over the bar. Good win for Inter. Solid, solid, absolutely solid. And they go... 
they just showed everyone that they don't even need Lautaro Martinez as the bomber of the league. They had a severely misfiring Arnautovic up front and they still managed to get the job done. Mm. And not only did they get the job done, but that misfiring Arnautovic also fucking managed to play one of the most beautiful assists I've seen this season. Not to mention um, Jan Bissek having kind of like a Malik Chow um, emergence into the league. Um, had to, has shown that he's extremely competent on the ball. We highlighted how good he is and how skilled he is at keeping possession and yeah, yeah. how press resistant he is in the last episode. Um, this match, he hit the crossbar, I believe, and then he scored the goal right after. Yep, yeah, that's it. Do you and think... The technique on that header, huh? Yeah, hey, it, it, weird. Uh, weird, but it worked. It worked. It worked. He like almost jumped up and like closed his body into a ball and hit it back. Like yeah. flicked up his head upwards, you know. Sergio Ramos has a brilliant one like that when he was uh, young against Barca and the Atlasco it came 3-3 when Messi scored a hat-trick. As, Which like, a version of, of Ramos is this? Is long hair. Sl- slick back lizard Ramos? No, or... Right back. Right okay. back Ramos with long hair and a white headband. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the lizard The maniac. Ramos. Yeah. The fucking maniac. Yeah. Um, is Bissek a potential starter when Inter are fully fit at the back? Honestly, man, yes. <clears throat> yes. Um, so you look at, you've got Bastoni, Acerbi, Bissek. You have Devray who's out. I think Bissek um, can comfortably bench Devray. Nowadays, um, yes. Nowadays, yes. Um, Devray, three seasons ago, was top. He was the top. shit. He was incredible. Um, but it's been quite the regression since then. I think Bissek is on the up, and it would be wise, actually, to give him more playing time ahead of De Vrij. Mm-hmm. Um, other than that, you know, I mean, yes, that's 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 the man he has to dis- displace. So I think I think he can totally do it. Pretty much, probably starting alongside uh, Bastoni and Acerbi. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think Darmian as well would be a candidate for that centre back position. But to be honest, Darmian is just a. A squad player that you can pop in to fit any hole. They'll you know? need rotation yeah. anyway, so they will still be playing everywhere. <laughs> These um, were the substitute fullbacks as well for inter wing, wing backs rather. <coughs> yeah, so Augusto and Darmian they did a fantastic job. I I think so. I think so. Um, Arnautovic's performance. Um, so you said how Inter they don't even need uh, Lautaro Martinez <laughs> yeah. to to win a game. Um, I think they would have won it so much more easily <laughs> if he was on the pitch because yeah. he just seemed, he seems like someone that's been playing in Saudi, <laughs> I know. Ar- Arnautovic, he seems a step behind. Um, well, he's you not know? getting any younger, is he? Well, he's not getting any younger, no, but you see, for example, what Zeko is capable of doing mm-hmm. for, for Inter, fucking... Yeah. The thing is, when you when you have veteran players like this, so Arnautovic is 34 years old. Last season, he started the season with a bang for Bologna, scored a, plenty of goals. Mm-hmm. Um, then he got injured, and he kept getting injured almost towards the end of the season, and he was poached by Inter, right? So now he finds himself in his first season at Inter at 34 years old. Mm. The problem is, when it comes to players at that age, there is no time to settle. Mm -hmm. There is no period of of adjustment. You're brought in and you need to have an immediate impact. We forget that Arnautovic needs to settle into the center side. He needs to get used to the way they play. It's a totally different system to what he was used to at Bologna. So is it my, my question and my point is, is it fair to criticize veteran players harsher or more harshly rather? I I think um, that as a veteran league player who's been at Bologna before, sure you need time to settle, but what you get when you invest in a player that has proven himself in a league is that the adjustment period should be shorter. Yes. Now, obviously, he's not starting many games because there's Turam and Lautaro who are untouchable. Um, He was out for around six months last season. I believe he tore his cruciate ligament last year at, at Bologna. Yeah, I, 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 I didn't think know that was the extent of it. Um, I know he had a serious injury. I'm not sure if that was the one, but but fucking hell. Uh-huh. He had a tough injury for, for sure. I, I don't think it's a matter of him getting used to the system. Um, 
But b- because he seemed to be at the right place at the right time, you, you know, mm-hmm. and, and his link up play and his hold up play was good. It's just about his finishing was off. Yeah, yeah. You know, it could be a matter of confidence. It could be a matter of misfortune. It could be. It could be many things. Oh, and that was like the whole thing of the game. Like give give Arnautovic yeah. his first goal, and everyone <laughs> celebrating so with him for the assist. And I, I, it, it must suck to be the player when that's the case. Like yeah. it's all about you not being able to score. Like that's... and he. He seemed visibly frustrated, like like fucking yelling at himself and hitting himself <laughs> on the head. Like it was like Dobby and Harry Potter. <laughs> um, yeah, CDK is the fucking CEO of, yes. the, of that. Uh, even if he gets like an assist and a goal in a game, like everyone's just like celebrating with him, like he's playing well, you know. Mm. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, well, he's going to have his opportunities to get a goal, and I'm sure Arnautovic is not going to be the kind of guy to struggle too much to, to, to get a goal in the future. Yeah, no. Um, if, if you want, we can discuss Zielinski to winter again. <laughs> but no, no, I don't no. think there's I, I any need there's to do that. Need. Yes, he will fit in nicely over there, considering Fratesi doesn't seem to have settled as well as he would have hoped, Fratesi. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mintoff on the group chat said that maybe interview him as too selfish. I when I watched Frate, so I get that mm. he, he he can be that kind of player, but but from watching him at Inter, he didn't seem that way to me. I agree. The, obviously, Inzaghi sees things differently to to Jake and Matt from Serie A spotlight, <laughs> you know. But I didn't see him to be that way. I think it's more of a question of where does he fit into this team? Because Zielinski, to me, direct replacement for Mkhitaryan. Yeah, bang on, fucking um, Medzala. Is the, the is the word the, the exactly Mezzala yeah, the, the half winger as he... exactly so he'll he'll definitely slot in perfectly over there. Fratesi is more a replacement for Barella. Yeah, that's box the way I see it. Midfielder, box to box yeah. midfielder and quite tidy up front if if they need to push him up further. I feel like Fratesi is literally a budget Barella man. Yeah, and he's always got goals. He's a hard worker. Um, he's 24 years old. He's got time on his side. And he's got a very good player ahead of him to, to mentor him. Yeah, him. yeah. But so I don't think he's out of favour. I think it's it's just a question of where. Yeah. Um, we also saw, by the way, this game. Uh, we saw Chalanoglu giving the ball away a lot in the final third. Uh, in his half. And... That's I, I don't know if it happened last week as well and we addressed it or if we spoke about it off the he point. He was... Um, no, we, we discussed how he's not as press resistant. Uh-huh, he's not a press resistant bro. number six. And, and he was dispossessed in the last match by... Um, Rovella. Yeah. Rovella and then Rovella had that chance. Uh-huh. Yeah, that, that's, that, that puts him, in my opinion... Um, a tier below Lobotka and Ben Asser when it comes to that sixth position. Shalanoglu has strengths that Ben Asser and Lobotka do not have, but as a six on my team, I know who I would want, personally. Do you, do you know how many times Shalanoglu lost possession in this game? Mm. 15 times. 15 times, there we go. That's not what you want from your, from your anchor. <laughs> Perhaps not. Perhaps yeah. not. It was a bit of a scrappy game, of course, by Inter. They had to make use of the players, the rotation players. Um, moving on to Lecce a little bit, um, Banda's a naughty boy. And we've highlighted that Banda's a naughty boy over here. And He's got a tude, huh? He's got a tude and fucking referees often forgive him because he's often picked on because yeah. of his height, five foot three. Yeah. Um, so quite often he'll get out muscles, he'll get frustrated, he'll lash out and referees close an eye, you know, because they go, well, that must be frustrating, he's so much smaller. Um, it's the opposite, you know, for example, what Frank Kessie used to experience at Milan, being so exactly. big and like on a 50-50, the player got like, went, oh, the second he's hit, like a yellow card to Kessie. It's like, oh, come on, dude, those are shoulder to shoulder. He's just very strong. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, Banda um, probably deserved this red card as well as probably deserving many more this season alone. I mean, probably, man. Yeah, but Banda... He... He, 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 so he's got attitude problems and, and the thing that annoys me is that he really lets it affect his performances. Yeah, like yeah. when he's pissed off, he looks like, you know when you hit someone a bit too hard in a five-a-side <laughs> and then they get the ball and they start dribbling and they kick the ball really hard. They, they shoot no. the ball really hard. Like they're throwing a little They tantrum. play with anger. They play with anger. But Manda does that. He doesn't, yeah, have, a, he doesn't have a cool And head. he does it like... 
in the worst way possible. It's not like Berardi mm. where he gets pissed off and you can see it in his face and then everything he tries to do, he tries to make it work. Mm-hmm. With Bandas, it's lashing out, kicking randomly, fucking yeah. flailing his arms. It's, it's reckless, you know? It can really, really cost your team. Um, also, bro, not sold on Roberto Piccoli. I'm not sure he should be starting over Kristovic. The positions Piccoli's finding himself in where he just tees and power shots from out of the box. I would love to see Kristovic with his back towards goal in those situations because he's a very smart player, smarter than Piccoli. I want to know what happened. I, 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 the I dry spell, know. right? I mean, dry spell and Piccoli started scoring, so he's getting the chance he deserves, to be fair. Yeah, and I mean, to be fair, he's been scoring. It's just, obviously, if we were to judge him on his performance against Inter, then, then let, let's look at the team's performance and not just... How Piccoli failed to score. Remember that this guy probably there's some clause in his contract since he's on loan from Atalanta, yeah. which states that he needs to play a certain amount of minutes, right? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a fair point. Um, but if you just look at how he performed this game, granted he was a striker for Electric against Inter. Let's keep that in mind. But he was on the pitch for 73 minutes. He touched the ball 16 times. He played eight passes and failed four of them. Um, he had five ground duels, he didn't win any of them. He won one out of three aerial duels and he lost possession 11 times out of, and had 16 touches. That's that's wild. You know, that's not a good performance at all. It's um, not a good performance at all, but he's, he's they played with a lone striker um, with Strefetz out on one side, Band out on the other. They're like the two shortest players in Serie A. And then Piccoli in the middle between fucking Acerbi, Bastoni and Bissek just yeah, getting never. fucking <laughs> boom every every single time that he gets the ball like I, 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 he was set up for failure in this game probably Kristovic would have had a nightmare in this game as well I think Kristovic would have been better because uh, his know, movement like, is better you just Ooh. need to hold the ball up and wait Piccoli has a habit of turning and shooting and I can't stand that Kristovic is amazing at holding the ball up. But, I think Kristovic is a, is a better striker. Yeah. But we'll, we'll, we'll see who gets more minutes in, yeah. in the future. I am hoping it's Kristovic. Shout out Pongracic, by the way, who was uncertain for the game and had a pretty fucking solid game. Man. Yeah, he He's played so the good. entire game and, yeah. and he was doubtful. Um, he wasn't supposed to play. I'm not quite sure what's wrong with him. But Did you hear what Baskerato said before the game in the dressing room? No. He said... Um, it's nothing funny it's just hype you know he was like um, I played in the lower tiers uh, and I worked my way up for games like this but he said it and like no one reacted God, <laughs> <laughs> like, he just said it and looked down why, like, <laughs> why, why is this about you bro like <laughs> the guy was journaling out loud like like nice try you know the players around him don't even speak Italian <laughs> <laughs> but yeah yeah I mean let's try in 12th on 20 points not not too shabby, um, but okay. Uh, 12th on 20 points is only 6 points away from 18th place uh, Cagliari. Well, 7 points uh, ahead of 18th place Cagliari, which, which is not a, a distant margin. Inter first, 44 points, 4 points ahead of Juve. I think we should talk about Frozzy now, bro. Frozzy 1, Juve 2. Mm-hmm. Right? Frozzy, of course, being Frozenone, for those of you who don't understand humor. <laughs> Um, for Sinon, of course, we're missing quite a few players. Ibrahimovic is still out injured. Yes, the 17 year old wonder kid out on the wing was not available. Um, Kalaj or Kalai, I'm not sure. He's Albanian. Please, if there's anyone who knows how to pronounce that, DM me. I mean, Manai is Albanian. Yes, but is it Manaj or Manai? Remember, that was oh, our whole my, thing. <laughs> what the hell, bro? <laughs> Markitsa, Mazzetelli, Oyono, and Reiner were all out for Frosinone, all important players, um, mostly all important players, um, and they did miss them, in fact. Um, Chiesa was out for Juventus, Deshilio, Fajoli, Keane, and Pogba, of course, the usual suspect, speaking of naughty, naughty boys. <laughs> um, as to the lineups, uh, it was a 3 4 2 1 for Frosinone, interestingly enough, with Caio Georgia starting up front against his former team. And there are also actually a few former team. My ass, he's still owned by Juve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And these guys are all owned by Juve on loan at Frozenona. There's Berenchea, Sule, and Caio Giorgio. I think the best performer of the lot was probably Sule, but not nothing crazy this game. Yeah. 
Um, for Juve, it was a 3-5-2 with Milik and Yildiz up front. Yildiz getting his first start for Juventus at 18 years old. He's a young Turkish talent that's been favoured by Vincenzo Montella at the Turkish national team, as mentioned earlier. Also, interestingly enough, um, Gatti was benched for Alexandro for this game. <laughs> Okay, so the match began with a stunning display of prowess by the young talent Yildiz, who scored an early goal for Juventus after Turati gave possession away because of his first touch. It was poor. It was yeah. shit. Um, Turati has made quite a few mistakes recently, bro. Yeah, he can't stop making mistakes yeah. at the moment, Turati. Yildiz slipped through three men casually and hammered it into the near post. However, Frosinone responded valiantly, um, leveling the score through Baez early in the second half. Funnily enough, Baez only came on because Lirola had fallen injured. Monterizzi played him through brilliantly and Baez finished expertly, um, giving, equalizing for Frosinone. Harui's curling strike was well saved by Chesney in about the 70th minute and McKenney's volley rattled the crossbar shortly after. It was like a standing scissor kick at that. Mm. Um, the game's pivotal moment came as Vlaovic, um, making a significant impact after being introduced, sealed the victory for Juventus with a superb header after Frosinone decided not to press McKenney out wide. Um, I don't know what the hell that was. That was yeah. an amateur, bro. That, that was that was so bad. You have a professional football player out on the wing, and you give him that much space. Like the guy has been playing as a wing back. Like granted, he's not the most technically gifted player in the world, but you you close him down there. I mean, when you have that much time and space, you, you could make an average player look real fucking good, yeah. man. And not saying McKenny is an average player, but as well, you said he he was playing as a right wing back. Yeah, so maybe he could whoop in across. Close him down, man. Jesus Christ, there's this fucking Vlaovic lurking in the box. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, he wasn't, correction, he wasn't actually playing as a right wing back this game, but he has recently featured. Yes, yes, yes. Right but as in, okay. b- because he often plays as a right yeah. wing back, he could obviously deliver a cross. Like. Yeah, absolutely. Um, he's been fucking fantastic, by the way, this season, McKinney, man. He really has been. I think that he's, he's really um, come a long way since his first season at, at Juve. Mm-hmm. Um, who's even le- loaned out to Leeds for a while? Like so, this is this is a very good trajectory he's on. Yeah. Vlaovic nearly made it a brace um, in the second half, only to be denied by VAR. He was in an obviously offside position. Um, Juve were able to hang on and confirm all three points. So yeah, um, funnily enough, in the offside goal, by the way, um, Torati was beaten at his near post. Um, <laughs> what do you think, man? Do you keep playing him? Torati. Yeah. Depends. Who, who the hell do they have so on the bench? So it's Michele Cerofolini, who uh, Cerofolini. Yes, had five appearances for Fiorentina. Was loaned out to the likes of Cosenza, Biscaglia, <laughs> Biscaglia, <laughs> Reg, 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 Regina, Regiana. Sorry, Regiana. He had nineteen appearances for Regiana. But this guy, that's it. He's never had more than nineteen appearances for a team in a season, and it was for Regiana. So. So I don't know how ready he is. I, I mean... 24 years old also, by the way, Sheriff Olin. He's not even experienced. Well, fucking wait till January and, and sign a Berisha of sorts. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, Maybe, there are quite a few. Yeah, there, there, there are plenty of, of good keepers in, in Serie A. Maybe try, try bring in Cranio on a loan. Yeah. For example, that that'll be good to get to get him some minutes. I'm starting to think that Cranio will only ever play when he's out on a loan because the second he's owned by someone, he <laughs> never gets a fucking minute. Poor guy. But he's he's having a nightmare right now, Torati. It's like he every is, yeah. match that he's playing, first he stop passing the ball back to him. <laughs> Jesus for the love of God. And secondly, he <laughs> just keep someone on the near post. Torati started off the season playing very well. He well, not start of the season. Last season, he played very well. And the season was all right from the get-go. Um, he became very confident. He went out and said that he's a, he's an Inter fan and that he's often seen with the Curva Nord mm. and hasn't had a good game since. So I don't know if that's a coincidence or, <laughs> or not. Ma. Um, yes, he's also, let's not forget that Turati is on loan from Sassuolo. So loaning in another goalkeeper might, might prove from to be From Sassuolo as well. Yes, from Sassuolo, <laughs> funnily enough. Yeah. Another klutz for them. Yeah. But of course, for his age, of course, he's a very talented goalkeeper. 22 years old is actually like 14 years old in goalkeeping years. So, Literally. So uh-huh, um, it's not been easy for him at all. Yeah. Um, Szczesnia, on the other hand, pff, 
incredible, incredible shot stopper, man. Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's no secret. I think people forget that this is the same Chesney that played in the World Cup last year and and saved Messi's penalty. You know, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Or the that that because that gave him um, a lot of fame among the mainstream. Um, but yeah, great goalkeeper. He was wearing a hat. He was wearing this a game. hat. This looked, game. looked real cool, Wojciech. Yeah. Personally, if I were a goalkeeper and it was sunny, I'd just wear sunglasses. <laughs> I'd wear a cool <laughs> pair of Ray-Bans or yeah. like the Morpheus sunglasses. What, what, what shape would you go? I think I'd go big, tinted and round. Oh, Yeah, like kind of Morpheus, but bigger. I, I'd, I'd wear like those, those sporty American ones like ah, that people go dovish. jogging in. Yeah, yeah. That, those are fucking... Aerodynamic. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, those are fucking cool, man. But you have to be a loser to wear a hat. But anyway, <laughs> um... <laughs> once when I was playing keeper for Mosta, and I was having a nightmare because the second we used to play another team and, and not being at training, I used to I used to get panic attacks and I used to concede seven. Like um, that's something that used to happen. And once I was wearing a hat and the ball bounced off my hat and went in in comical fashion. Oh my god! Like the ball was looping over me. I was running back, like with my, I was running backwards essentially, and looking up. And when I looked up, the ball hit my cap and went into the back of the net. Damn! Yeah. How did you react? Did I you mean, slam your hat to the ground and like, fuck! No, bro, I'm telling you, the, the, I, I was super fucking anxious, like as, as if I would make it about me. I'd just stand there, hope no one realized. Just put wear your hat lower, <laughs> cover your eyes. <laughs> okay. Um... I wanted to make a point as well. Yes, 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 yes. This is it, bro. So last week, Juve conceded three minutes into the second half against Genoa. This week, they conceded six minutes into the second half against Frosinone. An improvement? <laughs> <laughs> Massive improvement. <laughs> it, it, it seems to only happen against newly promoted teams. They need to wake up on that second half. Yeah, I, I th- honestly, genuinely, it might be a lapse in concentration. Like, Absolutely, it, man. It honestly might be. Uh, exactly for a team to hit you so early on in the second half it has to be that you know it takes you a while to settle back into the game Mm -hmm. and that needs to be addressed by Allegri of course but thankfully they thankfully for them they got it done this game yeah Blocatelli went off injured again he's having Ah. a bit of a mare this season um Nicolucci came in and pinged a few balls upon entry he looked pretty good at least giving um Juve fans some hope that he will be back at his best Mm -hmm. that is however a role that they should focus on uh filling in in January I, I think, think that's the that's the difference between that that's what's stopping Juve from taking that next step, a real anchor in that midfield. Yep. Imagine this team with Ben Nasser or Lobotka. Yeah, I yeah. know we always mention those two because they're literally the best two examples we could give. Um, there was a point. Maxime Lopez was on the right trajectory. Now he joined Fiorentina and he hasn't quite hit the ground running. Hey, but man. Back in his day when he was like, Killing it at Sassuolo would have been a mm-hmm. great, great shout for the side. You Even know, Torreira, man. Where, where Tor- the hell is Torreira now? Torreira had gone back to Arsenal and, and then I don't know where he, he ended up the after, face of the earth. after that. Yeah. Um, Remo motherfucking Freuler is oh, another yeah. there we go. six who really didn't hit it off in the Prem because sometimes they don't understand football. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, he's, he's back at Bologna. Yeah, um, as far as this game goes, I think we're done. I want to highlight how poor Rabiot's pass accuracy was this game upon upon his return from suspension. Mm-hmm. He had 68% accurate passes. He completed 25 out of 37 passes. Not not his best game. No, no, yeah. perhaps not. I, I just also want to mention Frosinone. I don't think they're safe like obviously no one is safe and that kind of thing from from relegation but yes they're expressive yes they're dangerous they're explosive they're terrible defensively though bro they are very very bad defensively Mm -hmm. it's not it's not good at all and they're they're bad when they're not in the game anymore like not when they're not in the game when they when they when they concede and they're down Mm. they don't have that courage or experience to yeah. rise up and fucking get back in the game. You know yeah, what I mean? Like exactly. Cagliari do. Um, they do need experience, as we as we mentioned in the last episode as well. Mm-hmm. They need to bring in a few reinforcements in January because they have 19 points. And remember, teams have been relegated with 30 points. Yeah. So so it's still early on and they could, they're still not safe, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's often teams who lack experience to get relegated. Um, throw back to Venezia. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, standings. So as it, for now, Frosinone are fine. They're in fourteenth with nineteen points. 
um, while Juventus find themselves in second with four point, 40 points, sorry, four points <laughs> behind Inter. Yeah. Salernitana 2, Milan 2. The return of Pippon Zaghi, that is another Inzaghi that's really uh, sticking it to Milan this yeah. season. All um, the Inzaghis are just taking it in turns on Milan. At this, at yeah, this just, to, just to fuck Milan. Uh, Milan had a strong starting eleven. They had a lot of uh, players back from injury. Um, they started in their preferred 4-3-3, 4-2-3-1, however you want to look at it. With the midfield three of Ben Nasser, Reinders and Loftus-Cheek, which is like the dream scenario for Milan this season. Um, the attacking trident of Leao, Pulisic and Giroud. And the defence, obviously, yep, yeah, Tomori alongside Kier. Um, Kier obviously not being the, fir- the the preferred choice, but, you know, he, he can do a decent job over there. Salernitana, on, on the other hand, just a couple of injuries for them in Maggiore and Ochoa. So they had um, Costil in goal, naturally. I wonder if he took that selfie with Giroud after the game. I think, <laughs> yeah. I don't think the Giroud... Official... Milan account actually tweeted um, like a video of um, Costil warming up, then it pans to Giroud warming up, and they're doing the exact same things. You know, it's hilarious. <laughs> like, like one touches the left eye rod, the other one touches the left eye rod. So funny. The Milan were coming off a very convincing 3 0 victory against Monza, where they had started with a three at the back, but it, it, it wasn't the case. Um, in this match, they decided to opt for their four at the back formation. Salernitana, on the other hand, they were coming off a devastating 4-1 loss to Atalanta. Um, in the sixth minute, brother Rich Smith's hit shot proved to be a dangerous cross, and they almost opened the scoring, but Mania denied him quite comfortably, to be honest. In the 15th minute, Milan actually took the lead as Reinders found Leao in the box. Uh, r- then Rafa crossed the ball and it was deflected and it fell to Tomori, who headed in for the opening goal. He had a failed knee slide celebration. <laughs> yeah, that needs to be addressed. Huh? Is it any coincidence that he went off injured after? I don't know, man. That was the same thing as Okafor last week. And you see Okafor celebrating and he seems to pull <laughs> up. And I see Tomori attem- attempting a knee slide in Salerno. Like, are you mad? You you pointed out that you thought he was um, joking. That, I thought, that he, thought was he was kind of mocking the claim that Okafor injured himself celebrating. But it turns out, yes, he tried to knee slide and he he might have hurt himself like that. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. It It's it just, um, you know, when you go to knee slide and the ground is really dry, so you end up busting your knees and fucking flying. Well, that, that's what happened to Tomori. Mm-hmm. In the 29th minute, Benacer almost scored an own goal after misheading an attacking cross by Kondreva, <laughs> forcing Mike into a good save. Welcome back, Benacer. In the 40th minute, Castanos almost equalised, sliding in to connect with a Kondreva cross, but Manian denied him well. Uh, two minutes later, Salernitana equalised with Fazio's header from Kondreva's corner, exploiting Milan's struggles at defending set pieces. In the 60th minute, Salernitana took a shock lead as Tomori went down with a muscle injury and Manian misread Kandreva's strike from distance, letting it slip through his gloves and into the near post. Florenzi came on for Tomori to take on left-back, with Teo slipping in at centre-back, since Simic had already come on from, for Kier at half-time. In the 82nd minute, Jovic subbed in for Ben Nasser, um, had two chances, but still denied um, his header and his follow-up shot. And then in the 90th minute, Jovic redeemed himself, volleying in Giroud's knockdown to salvage a point for Milan. There's so much to talk about. So, so much to talk about. Um, but Milan, at full strength, failing to get three points against last-placed Salernitana. I think this fucking confirms how bad the situation is in Milan at the moment. Uh uh-huh, because... The approach wasn't terrible by Milan. And statistically, the performance wasn't bad. Milan were by far the superior team. Now, what bothers me is the lack of reaction when certain things happen on the pitch. What bothers me is how you have a player like Rafael Leao, who is absolutely insane and unplayable on the break, and driving to the byline and cutting back or crossing in or, you know, doing what he does best. And then you have a player like that who for some reason has the liberty to shoot from anywhere he wants. To fucking try dribble down the middle. To, I, I, I can't understand it. I can't understand the lack of discipline. And this isn't only Leo. 
It's it's fucking everyone. From Rinders, we've been saying it all season. From the, to, I don't know, man, Ruben Loftus-Cheek. I don't know what happened to him after that PSG game. He was a fucking war tank. He seems to be playing with a knock or something. I, I, I don't know what it is. I think mm-hmm. he's just one of those players that's either fully fit and brilliant and because of the effort he puts in when he's fully fit and brilliant, he plays with a knock for for like five games after. You know what I mean? That's his profile and that's what Milan knew they were getting when they when they signed him. The injury crisis at the back is just ridiculous at this, it's at this point. Like, Milan had to recall Gabia back from Villarreal. Like, you know, are you like, serious? You know, like, come I mean? on, is, is it that fucking bad? Like, how, how is this happening? You know, now apparently the physiotherapists are, might get sacked. Like, come on, uh, of course, man, something needs to be done. Something is obviously broken over here. Something isn't functional. That's just my 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 opinion in a nutshell, man. Plus, not to mention that it, it was unfortunate for for Milan as well. You have an uncharacteristic Mike Manian mistake at the near post, like Kandreva. Fucking in 2017, I tweeted, bro. Mm. I tweeted, Kandreva scares me as a player. Mm. He won't hit a single cross all game, but then he'll score from 50 yards out. Yeah. He's an unpredictable donkey. That was my tweet yeah. in 2017. Last week, I retweeted it. I'm like, well, this is an eternal tweet. This is the eternal reality of Kandreva, man. Kandreva can just fucking have it from anywhere, and I don't know if it's fortune. Maybe he was <laughs> born with the ability to turn anything he touches into gold, but... But that's just crazy how he beat Mike Manian from there, man. Yeah, I, I think I think I pretty much mirror what you're saying. In Milan, lost this game because of a lack of tactical discipline mm. and the lack of structure that there is within the team, and that can only come from one place, in my opinion, um, which is purely losing the dressing room. I think Leao with fucking three men open in front of him, he cuts inside and and, and goes goes for a shot in the manner which he does, and and. Shooting is shooting and passing are his fucking worst qualities. Mm. Leao was good at one thing: get the ball, run, cut it back. If you want, run into a good position and go for a goal. Sure, but his his judgment in certain positions is god awful. Yeah, god awful. His shooting is terrible. Um, it's long range shooting specifically. Yeah, Loftus cheek. Disappointing performance by him. Reinders, similar to Leao in the sense that look up, look at your teammates and try pick a pass. You don't have to try score every single game. It just seems like it's... And this is what happens when you make so many signings and you, you put 11 new signings pretty much next to each other. Is There's individualism. In in football, the way you win a match is by winning the midfield battle. It, it's it's you have to dominate the center of the pitch, and mm-hmm. then you need to focus on on the the wide players. Milan cannot dominate games with Ben Nasser, Reinders, and Loftus Cheek still fucking getting used to each other. Reinders and Loftus Cheek looked like they fucking like they were a match made in heaven in the opening matches mm-hmm. of the season. Um, Krunic was doing a good job, but obviously now he's fallen out of favor. And then it was Adli, and then it was Musa, then it was Adli again, it was Musa again, and now Ben Nasser is back in. That is the instability that is in the in, in the center of Milan's pitch. Milan aren't going to win the league from Leao running down the wing, cutting it back, and Giroud tapping in, or winning a penalty and Giroud scoring the penalty. That's not how you win a league. Milan need to address. The situation that, that is a lack of tactical discipline and essentially a midfield that is constantly getting run over mm-hmm. because that's what that midfield is doing. It's getting run over. Let me talk about something that I, I noticed in the game, which was the, the set pieces in this match, both for Milan offensively and defensively. So offensively, Milan have a new system. So you'll notice that Milan have been a bit more successful. Fucking mashallah. From set pieces, from set pieces, yeah. um, and a large part of that has to do with Leao being placed at the at the far post for for free kicks and for corners. He's taking on a bit of a Dragusin role, yeah, yeah. where he's not great at heading the ball towards goal, but he's tall. You could ping the ball to him, and he could head it into a more dangerous area. Right, this worked in Milan's match against Monza, where Simic scored thanks to Leao's contribution. Um, that that was a the, the same system. 
So that is what Milan are doing offensively. Defensively, um, so Kier was man-marking Fazio in each and every Salernitana set piece. He was occasionally even being double-marked, right, by Kier and Loftus-Cheek. So it's mm-hmm. not a matter of Milan not respecting Fazio's ability yeah. in the air because they respected it a lot. What Salernitana did was they, they picked this up and they placed blockers between Kier and and Fazio. So they put two players between them, creating distance between them, allowing Fazio the liberty to move freely. Mm-hmm. He didn't have Kier holding mm-hmm. him down or Kier putting pressure on him. If you look at the goal, that's literally what happens. Yeah. Kier was far away from him, trying to catch up to him. And then Loftus-Cheek tried to intervene to no avail, and he got the goal over there. So Salernitana, over there, they were really smart, and they managed to fuck Milan through, through a little yeah. tactical adjustment. Yeah. Yeah, um, brilliant observations, of course. Um, I also want to um, highlight uh, the lack of urgency, man, quite simply. Like, Milan's are are starting off games pretty well. You know, you remember the curse of the first half? Milan wouldn't score in the first half. That was a whole thing. The first half would always be wasted. Now Milan are getting early goals. But then the problem is they're not fucking reacting when the other team equalizes. Like, Or they're hanging on to that slender lead. And missing many chances, being wasteful, and and allowing the team back into the game. The Napoli times? game, yes, the Verona so game. Many, so Come many, on, so many, man. Um, yes, I, I think it's just uh, an inability to react, um, an inability, a, a lack of communication between the players and the management. We've seen, we've seen, we've heard the players what they said. You know, mm. um, we didn't know whether to attack, we didn't know whether to to press, to push up, to to hold back. You know, we have. Players saying this about the the manager. That's, that's miserable that's to miserable, hear. Yeah, miserable. Yeah, miserable. To hear. Um, in this case, for example, okay, granted, you're one one in the first half. You go out in the second half, react. You know. Yeah. React. Um, you're the you're you're full fucking squad. You you you're the full team. Uh, offensively, you, you have no one missing. It's been, Milan have been plagued with injuries for so long. You know. Yeah. Yo, they no, are there shocking was, statistic. There was nothing, man. And not to mention, sorry, one more thing. Um, the, these individual layers that are costing goals. This oh. time it was Manian, Adli not tracking back, and that one goal, and then you had the other one, Shukweza not tracking back. You have all these fucking individual layers. It's too much. Yeah. What's your stat? Um, across all teams, Milan are fifth highest for shots against, both in total and per 90 minutes. So in total, Milan have conceded 229 shots in the opening 17 matches of the season and per 90 they average 12 shots conceded every single game a team shoots at least 12 times against well an average of not at least to be fair okay there there are the injuries in defense there were the injuries in midfield at the start of the season there's the fact that Milan don't have a fucking holding midfielder but there's the fact that they don't close these players down yes, 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 yes yes that's the fact yes and 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 the misbalance in the midfield from from the fucking preparation in the summer. There's you know? no they defensive brought, there's player no in midfield. There's no defensive midfielder, and the only one that there is, Kronich, is off the fucking Turkey. To Fenerbahce, what a league, by the way, the Turkish it's league. A good just league. Just, to, just to put that league. out there, very fun. League. But yes, man, I feel like um, it's taken a bit of a depressing turn on podcast. <laughs> yes, I, I, I have. I feel like these are important points, though. Yeah. Um, Tomori will be out for two months after, <laughs> <laughs> after an MRI highlighted puns help me a myotendinous lesion of the right femoral bicep you need that bro trust me in other words a serious muscle injury um <laughs> he's looking at a minimum of two months out due to the severity of the problem now chow and kalulu are also out for the foreseeable future um gabia has returned from his loan at Villarreal, which is it's just sad um now Milan have been linked with uh, Jakub Kiwior and Clement Langley. Mm, fantastic, super, no? Yes, I, I like Kiwior. Jokes. I like Kiwior. Kiwior was very good in Italy, and <clears throat> I think he's been, he's at Arsenal, right? Yeah, is he, he is. Yeah. He is. Is he playing? I'm not sure. I don't. Really I think he's in and out. Okay, uh, I know Langley hasn't really been playing for Aston Villa. Mm. Not really a good sign, but who knows? It might prove to be a coup. Maybe I mean any reinforcements would do at the back as we, at the moment. Um, bring in a player on Nick, Nick the uh, Nick Bonucci from Roma. Yeah, <laughs> back back at Milan. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I'd rather fucking 
I'd rather see Patrick Starr playing as a centre back than no, Milan they'll get from the arm <laughs> <laughs> um, there's also Juan Miranda from Betis which is a left back option uh, where they, Milan are in desperate need for a backup for Teo Hernandez and then they're also interested in Seru let me try this uh, Seru Guirassi Seru Guirassi is a 27 year old French 6 foot 2 striker who Ooh, plays German at- league guy who plays at Stuttgart. He's currently got 17 goals in 14 matches. Mm-hmm. I also heard that Milan, listen to this, Milan weren't interested in getting another striker because Jovic has been so good. Mm-hmm. Jovic is injured now. Honestly, honestly, this is a good one. Because how many times do the management, do they not learn? Like, literally. Like you've got, okay, Jovic, he hit good form. But the other guy is 37 years old. Yeah. So like, you know, <laughs> I like buy another look. striker. You should have three. Like, like Okafor is barely fucking. <sighs> he's, he's struggled so much with injuries, and then you have Jovic. Okay, he's had four good weeks, but don't forget the rest. Yeah, it's tragic. What if he goes back to that form? You know, bring in another mm. striker. Milan clearly need a striker. But anyway, yes, please. Yeah, um, but I mean that is the shambolic state that Milan are in at the moment naturally the the next point I'm going to bring up is Pioli it almost seems done that he's not going to be Milan's manager next season mm. um we, we've we've heard four names which are such an upgrade um for Milan and where they want to be um stylistically sti- up, up, updates stylistically upgrades. they are they are upgrades exactly yeah, yeah. but when it comes to achievements they're all downgrades uh, well apart from one of them but the rest are downgrades. I mean, there's there's Motta. Exactly. Who, okay, like, like you're saying, from, from an achievement perspective, it's hard to beat Pioli since he won the, the, the Scudetto at Milan. Um, but Conte is the only one that would be an upgrade yeah. from, from that perspective. Um, but there's Motta, Deserbi, and Conte. Was yeah. there another one? There was a fourth one? Um, I believe those those were the names I've seen. So, ah, uh-huh. Abate. <laughs> <laughs> Abate as an interim. No, no, I, I, I don't think that that's... I don't think at any point should no, Milan no, 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 sack no, no, Pioli no. and uh, employ about it because no. there are two ways that can go. One is he achieves the bare minimum, which would be a fourth place finish or an Europa mm. League fucking victory, and for some reason they redeem about it, and then we're stuck. Milan are stuck with about it for, mm. for the foreseeable future, which isn't exactly a, no. a good thing. Um, granted, I don't think he's a terrible manager. Or he's a bad manager. In fact, I have no opinion of him as a manager because it's too early to call. But ex players tend to be the most um, underqualified employees yeah. that there are when it comes to management. Um, Conte would arrive. He would win you the league within two seasons, probably immediately. He'll win you the league. Um, but the problem is how he'll leave the club. You know, I think that Conte has shown that his strategy involves a lot of complaining, a lot of pushing and nagging for what he wants. Um, what he wants is often short term. He doesn't really care about developing youth. He cares about immediate results and he'll bring in players who are fucking towards the end of their careers and he'll push for them to the point that they'll end up on on inflated contracts. Um, You know, uh, (laughs) and it's not exactly ideal. He is the best candidate and he is the only upgrade in theory from the coaches we've mentioned. However, I would love... The Zerbi or Motta, literally either one of them. Yeah, I, I, w- I would definitely love the Zerbi or Motta. Those are the two ideals because, as well, they're they're young, progressive managers. Mm-hmm. You know, um, more more suited for Milan style. You get that Gagan press. You know, you get rapid counter attacking football mm-hmm. as well. Um, that that's the dream. That's the dream. Um, Conte, though, just to not disagree with you on on one thing, the way he leaves clubs. Um, when he left Juve, Juve won six more Scudetti in a row with with or five, I, I don't know, with Allegri. And when he left Inter and they got Inzaghi, they've also seen success. So mm-hmm. it's it's not like this is gonna set Milan back. This this decision will set Milan back ages. It actually might give Milan some pull power. It might get Milan some. It 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 is against Milan's values, no. But what Milan's values are causing is inexperience within the same squad. You look at the way that Milan lined up and you look at the way Milan are lining up. It's a bunch of, of, of players that have never played in Serie A before. Mm. 
or else there players that are still at Milan, no mm-hmm. signings from the same league, um, so on and so forth. So that philosophy does need tweaking. You can't just keep signing players like that. You do need some experience. And if Conte comes in and says, this man, we're going to sign a 30-year-old midfielder or a 30-year-old right wing back who used to be a striker <laughs> or a left winger two seasons ago, fuck it. Yeah. Fuck it. There are stages that you need to go through in football to get back to the top. And maybe this is one of them. Your, your point on the post um, Conte era at Juve and at Inter is a very fair one. Yes, I good good job. Thank you. Um, however, um, Milan's history as well, and another point um, against Conte, <laughs> <laughs> is that Milan are always expected to do well in Europe, no? Yeah, Conte doesn't do well. Doesn't in Europe. do well in Europe ever. at all. He's a domestic coach, and I feel like since Milan overachieved um, and had that incredible season where they won the league, I don't feel like they're in a rush, particularly to to win the league again. I don't think they're desperate mm. for a league win. What I'm saying is, I think they do afford to take a less guarantee, take more of a risk with the coaching selection mm. and bring in someone like Motta or Deserbi. And give them what they want. These these two coaches, especially De Zerbi, has not, they haven't had players of the quality that there are at Milan mm-hmm. right now. And I like De Zerbi because, you know, like Kevin Prince Boateng said, you're not going to take the piss with no, De Zerbi. No, no, no. He, he instills takes, such dude, discipline. He will fucking... And it's such expressive football, yes, man. Yeah, yeah, He will fucking pull his pants down and scream in your face, man, De Zerbi. Yeah. That's, that's what he does. So good luck not passing when there's yeah. that guy on the touchline. And then Motta, I feel like if you give Motta a project for fucking five years, he'll make a treble winning yeah. team. You know, you know, you know what <laughs> yeah, I mean? Yeah, it's so promising. I really like the way that Bologna can be pragmatic as well, not yeah. just beautifully expressive. But, you know, bring in Motta, bring in Zergzi as well. Huh? Oh, for sure, 100%. Bring in anyone, bring in Zergzi. Yeah. Bro, I think we should really move Go on to the because next we're, we're fucking <laughs> well over an hour in. And then we're on game three, is it? No. Yes. No. Game four. <laughs> game game four. four. Okay. <laughs> Next game. You're sorry. Um, Milan are in in third on thirty three points. They're seven points behind Juve, who are in second, and they're only two points ahead of Bologna in fourth, and three points ahead of Fiorentina in fifth. Here we go. Are Milan gonna make Champions League? Um, Salernitana dead last on nine points, and one of those points came in this game. Fuck this, man. Next. Speaking of Thiago Mata, speaking of Zergzi, speaking of fuck this. It's Bologna 1, Atalanta 0. Yes. For Bologna, they were missing Sao Mauro and Carlson. Don't think they'd be too bothered. For Atalanta, they were missing Palomino, Toloi, of course, um, El Bilal, Toure, and Vorlicki. Remember Vorlicki? We, we mentioned him once. <laughs> I've never actually seen him play. But I, I have absolutely no recollection. Come of on, we mentioned him once on the on the on the pod, and we laughed at his name. It could it could be Vorlicky. No, I'm pretty sure it's pronounced Vorlicky. Maybe I in prefer, hindsight, I, I like. prefer Vorlicky. <laughs> <laughs> um, Skorupski was in goal for Bologna. The return of Skorupski after um, Rav- Ravalia mm-hmm. was fucking fantastic. The yeah. opportunity he got, he really. Really took it, man. He was yeah. so good. He even saved the uh, Lautaro penalty. Yeah, uh, the interesting change over here in the Bologna eleven was that they started with John Lukumi mm. as the as the left back uh, to provide a bit more defensive stability. To, yeah, because you know, you know, we all know how Atalanta can be. They can overpower you. That Freuler and Moro in the middle, and Doy out on the right, Salamakers on the left, Ferguson and Zergzi playing up front. Of course, for Atalanta, it was a 3 4 1 2 formation, the usual stuff, this time starting with Lukman and the Keitelare up front with Ruggieri and Hatteber out on the wings, um, Kar- and Karnasecki in goal. Yeah. Now, this was, a, this was kind of a chess match, that has to be said. Yep. Um, Atalanta dictated most of the play and occupied most of the possession. Bologna seemed to want to hit on the counter-attack. The game was decided by Lewis Ferguson's late header in the 86th minute. Um, and Bologna climbed to fourth position, defying Atalanta's attempts in a game ca- characterized by strategic maneuvering and scarce goal-scoring opportunities. Now... Um, both teams engaged in calculated p- 
passes and phases of play in the first half. There were sporadic attempts from Salamakers and Lukman. Um, Lukman and Coop Miners failed to hit the target with their opportunities and Skorupski did extremely well to save Ederson's 1v1. He also did very well to kind of come out and uh, distract Lukman who failed to hit the target in a one-on-one. So despite not saving that Lukman opportunity when he was Mm. one-on-one, he made himself big enough for Lukman to hit the target. So that counts as a save, you know. Yeah, the second half witnessed early changes. Um, we saw Fabian replacing Moro and immediately taking a shot off target. It was mm-hmm. quite a good opportunity, to be honest. And Atalanta tried to mount the pressure with opportunities from Coop Miners, Lukman, and CDK, but they all failed to convert. It was painful. Lukman just couldn't hit the target. CDK didn't have enough sting in his step. Coop Miners just kept getting unlucky with his header looping over, and then he. He had a ball coming in. He would have just had to tap it in. But out of nowhere, Froiler, the ex-Atalanta man, slides in and just gets the slightest touch on the ball to stop it from going to Coop Miners. Yeah. Um, Bologna's offensive sparks emerged when Zergzi's was whenever Xerxes got the ball, basically. There was a point he got the ball, you know, he just glides left. Then he moves right, then he glides forward. You know, he set up Fabian incredibly, who missed a crucial chance. Yeah. Um... Yeah, then there were tactical substitutions. Muriel and Skamaka came on for Atalanta. Orsolini and Abusher came on for Bologna. And then the breakthrough arrived, of course, in the 86th minute, courtesy of a trademark, fantastic, incredible Orsolini corner. Absolutely, okay. bro. Yeah, that, that's a hilarious thing, by the way, the, that story you tell when you were preparing and everyone's like, oh, this fantastic Orsolini corner. Like, how, <laughs> Reading how articles, fantastic. everyone's saying, like, like p- p- superb fucking corner. <laughs> Like, how, good, how good can it be, man? <laughs> it's a corner. <laughs> <laughs> it was by the way. I didn't even. I hadn't even watched the highlights yet. I told you, Jay comes to this. Apparently, there's a spectacular <laughs> corner where they were like, "Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a corner," you know. And then this time, it was another fucking incredible corner to find Ferguson's head who netted the goal. He was marked by Scalvini, by the way. Yeah, so, yeah, uh, yeah. Interesting to 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 note. Ah uh-huh. no no Scal- Scalvini uh, as much as obviously we rave about him well, especially me because of his style of play mm-hmm. and what he's capable of doing <laughs> moving forward remember he's a a 19 year old guy playing as a as a center back um that still needs to brush up a lot defensively. Of course. He still has a lot of work to do defensively, but he shows great promise. Yeah. He's lucky it's uh, he's he's the perfect center back for a three at the back. I feel um, perfect w- within his age and within his capabilities, naturally. There was a moment, man, he got the ball um, on the opponent's byline. The way he kept it in, he looked like a fucking winger or something. Yeah, man. He's so technically yeah, gifted yeah, yeah. and he's good, man. He's really, really good, especially going forward. Kind of mm-hmm. reminds me of the Bastoni mold, you know, yeah, exactly. when it comes to advancing. It's like... The worst back three defensively that you could have, because they'd always be in the opposition box, would consist of Bastoni, Martinez, Cuarta, and, and Scalvini. Yeah, yeah. They would never defend you. Know? It's true. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking them all in, in the He was buying them all. <laughs> in, in Italy, had, had Conte taken over Italy, um, he'd, he'd have Scalvini and Bastoni on rotation. Probably. For sure. They're, they're two perfect centre-backs for, for that system, man. You ca- I, I don't feel like you could play them both, though. No, it, unless you you change it up, you know, one of mm. them stays back. Yeah. You know, maybe Bastoni is quite good from playing balls from deep, while Scaldi- Scalvini is very good at holding up play on the yeah, other yeah, end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But anyway, it's more but about anyway, this History game. was made, bro, this game. Um, Ferguson's match-winning header... Um, made him the highest ever goal scoring Scott in Serie A. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah, he's now scored 11 goals in Italy's top flight, overtaking Dennis Law's record set at Torino in 1961 1962. Okay, go Lewis, go Lewis. It's your birthday. It's your birthday. Yo, no, it's very good for Scottish football as well. That they have um, players playing very well in Italy. Of course, we saw Josh Doig. Um, Hickey was playing very well at Bologna. I imagine Hickey's still at Bologna. Hey. But yeah. Um, when it comes to this game, um, of course, I, I did some digging, by the way, on Xerxes. Uh-huh. To see what his contract situation is like. Because nice. 
Because he was obviously owned by Bayern Munich and initially loaned out, yeah. right? But then he was actually bought, right, by mm-hmm. by Bologna. However, there are conflicting reports. <gasps> There's Bild in Germany, the newspaper. They claim that Bayern have a 20 to 25 million buyback clause. While Gazzetta dello Sport claim that um, he has a 40, they have a 40 million euro buyback clause. Either way, he's so gonna fucking end up at Bayern Munich, eh, man? Yeah, Vice Kane. Um, he, they also have, however, however, very important to know, there's a 50% resale clause as well. So if a massive offer comes in, they might push for it, you know? Would they rather... Mi- ah, fair, fair enough. Can, so they could someone, make 20 million exactly. for if, if, if they sell, if, if someone buys them for 40 exactly. million. Bologna, by the way, got them for 8 million. Crazy man, so good business, huh? very good yeah. business. Um, John Lukumi, who started as a left back for Bologna, a bit of information on him. Um, he's been at Bologna since 2022, he has mm-hmm. 32 appearances. He's a Colombian international, he's six foot one and he's 25 years old. That's John Lukumi. Thank you very much, brother, for that. No problem. Well, Ferguson, the spotlight was on him earlier on, is 24 years old. Okay, um, He started his career with Hamilton Academica, mm-hmm. uh, moved to Aberdeen where he played 132 games and scored 27 goals and moved to Bologna uh, in 2022. He's been featuring for the Scot- Scottish international team since 2021 and has played 10 games for them. Oh. So it's definitely uphill in his career from here, Lewis Ferguson, and I expect international recognition for him. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but yes, this lest bo- we sorry, sorry, please, lest we forget, Calafiori is yeah. just twenty-one years old. Absolutely, and Calafiori. Lest we fucking forget, um, Roma could could use a player like him. Yeah, um, but I think, of course, Motta managed to bring something out of this player that possibly he didn't even know existed himself. Exactly, exactly, converting him into a centre back. But yes, as I mentioned earlier, Motta has this this ability to win games like a. Like a seasoned top team, he makes his team look like a cool, calm, experienced yes, team where they can get hit all game, but then they'll sucker punch you at the end of the game, and that will be enough for them to win it. You know, yeah, man? this is this is a- shots on goal. Bologna, sorry to interrupt you again. I'm horrible. I'm gonna punch you one, in the face. One <laughs> one shot on goal for Bologna, Bologna this game. That's what it takes. That that that's like. This doesn't even piss me off. Like when a team doesn't deserve to win when it's a tight game like that. Um, probably Atalanta were, were the more convincing team in the game. And Bologna get to get away with a victory over there. That's a fucking team that's fighting for Europe, man. That's a team that's fighting for Europe. There's a game you don't deserve. Win it anyway. Absolutely, man. Yeah. And they've and this shown is a, great maturity. Yeah. This is a piping hot Atalanta. By the way, yeah, because <laughs> oh my God bless God, you, thank Jesus you so much, Christ. Headphone users, <laughs> be <beware. laughs> because they beat Milan three two, and then they beat Salernitana four one, and obviously there was that midweek where they beat Rakov four 0 as well. Yeah, so it's not like it's an out of sorts Atalanta. It's a strong Atalanta team. That absolutely, they beat. absolutely, man. Um, pardon, by the way, though, we must sound terrible right now. We've been sick. Christmas time. Bro, everyone in the world has been sick. Have you seen this conspiracy? Yeah. The, the cough. The cough. Yeah. People in New York have the cough, and and people in fucking Malta have the cough. What's funny is that I never noticed that coughs were different. I thought it was a cough. It's like a. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, once I went to a festival, uh, and zigged the amount of dust there was in the fucking God. bathroom in the morning. Mm. Uh, taking my shower everyone around me <laughs> coughing and spitting it was like I was in a fucking god I don't even know man it's like I was at war Consilia somewhere in that shower yeah <laughs> <laughs> having too good a time oh jeez but no what we're talking about um, Bologna are in fourth with 31 points while Atalanta are in eighth with 26 points Monza nil, Fiorentina won. Some notable absentees for both teams. Nico Gonzalez, Giacomo Bonaventura. Jesus, let me start that again. Nico Gonzalez, Giacomo Bonaventura, Lucas Martinez, Quarta, Gaetano Castrovilli and Dodo all out for Fiorentina. Whereas Andrea Carboni, Gianluca Caprari and Papu Gomez naturally for Monza. 
a lot of injuries, so I am going to go through the lineup for Fiorentina. 4 2 3 1 formation Terracciano on goal, back line Kaiode, Milenkovic, Ranieri at centre back, and Biragi. Uh, Arthur Duncan in the double pivot. Ekone on the right wing, Barak as the attacking midfielder, Kwame on the left, and Beltran up front. For Monza, business as usual, they had the 3 5 2 formation that Dani Mota and, and Colpani up front, they had Akprak, Pro, Pessina, Gagliardini in the midfield with Kyriakopoulos and Pereira flanking everyone. Um, in the fifth minute, Ikona's powerful left footed shot was saved well by Di Gregorio because Di Gregorio is a great goalkeeper. Let's remember that. Let's remember that. Um, in the seventh minute, Beltran stuck out a leg to intercept Di Gregorio's pass, guiding the ball into the back of the net. Horrible and uncharacteristic error by Di Gregorio. In my opinion, questions do need to be asked uh, of Mari for playing the ball back to the keeper. Um, when clearly, he had few options and a lot of opposing players around him. There were two options, yes, but he's is. a goalkeeper, you know, just don't put him under that pressure for fuck's sakes, man. And no. the difference, by the way, between someone like Di Gregorio and someone like Mike Manian mm-hmm. is that Manian made that error and the first thing he did was scream at Teo Hernandez for blocking his line of vision. <laughs> So Come on, Can you Di, Di Gregorio <laughs> fucking grabbed his head like, what have I done? Yeah, yeah. And he apologized instantly. Can you imagine, bro? Your goalkeeper does that <laughs> points at you. You bro, broke it, bro. I can't see. <laughs> you pushed me. Oh, you pushed. Like, what? <laughs> All right, my man. god, man. In the ninth minute, Ekone did very well to beat his man and dribble past Di Gregorio, but his shot was cleared off the line spectacularly by D'Ambrosio. However, Ekone really took his time to place the ball on his favourite left foot and allowed D'Ambrosio to track back in time. Like, it was much easier. It's obviously impressive, the manner in which D'Ambrosio cleared the ball off the line, but... Ekone, dog. It, 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 fuck, man. Just <laughs> shoot. It's it's an empty net. <laughs> fuck your left foot. Like, Jorko. In the 30th minute, Monza had their first chance, with Kyriakopoulos missing an opportunity to equalize after a wayward first time strike. Uh, Kolpani was clean through initially, but Ekone did very well to track back and close down Monza's top scorer, who was forced into playing the pass. Um. In the second half, Colombo and Churia came on for Monza, uh, and Inzola replaced Beltran uh, for Fiorentina. Yeah, that'll solve it. That, that'll fix absolutely everything. Uh, in, 40, in the 48th minute, Churia's in swinging dangerous cross found Kyriakopoulos, who missed the target after arriving late. Um, but after that, there wasn't anything notable that I found um, to include in the rundown. Technically, this is a, a 1-0 victory for Fiorentina, who got... Um, you know, a, a goal very early on, and they managed to maintain the result. I think that, personally, Monza played a very good game defensively, mm-hmm. um, and it did take that one uncharacteristic error to give Fiorentina mm-hmm. the opportunity to score. Yes, and Monza seem to have lost a little bit of their sting, haven't they, recently? Yeah. They've not been on a good run of form um, by their standards. I feel like Colpani's form has kind of dipped as well. Um and it's just not quite ticking for them going together. I can't quite place what what the problem is. I noticed that this was a five at the back start for Monza. Yeah, yeah. Well, I three five two yeah, to be yeah, honest. Yeah. But they're very defensive minded players. You know, they're not the the quickest. When you see like Pereira and Kyriakopoulos, they're not the type they're gonna bomb up and down always. Like Kyriakopoulos. that's true. But Kyriakopoulos uh, had two opportunities to score. Huh? He was bombing yeah. forward. Y- yes, he uh, naturally he will. He will always. But even you look at the heat map, it's it's mostly in his Yeah, yeah, you know? that's true. And the same thing with, with Pereira. Mm. He was barely on the ball, to be honest. But when he was, it was at that halfway line. Yeah. But yeah, um, they, they do need to um, to sort themselves out. On the other hand, Fiorentina got um, a moment of luck, took it and managed to hold on. So Yeah, solid. yeah pretty, pretty much. Um, a lot of injuries for Fiorentina. Uh, which obviously influenced the slightly weaker performance that that Fiorentina had over here and why they they didn't play that sexier brand of football they're typically used to playing, albeit they they haven't really done that all season. Um, But I I was really hoping that Monza would take advantage of that and just 
let loose a little bit more, mm. attack a little bit more, have a bit more bite. Um, they attempted to do that in the second half by changing the formation to a to a three four three, bringing on Colombo and Churia. Um, but Fiorentina did well defensively. They did well to maintain the 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 one nil. Yeah, um, absolutely. I don't know if Monza will make any moves in the market, and I wonder honestly, coming into the season, what their ambitions were. Do they want to finish mid table or do they want to push for Europe? How on track are they with their ambitions? Mm. That's something I'm curious to to know. And I guess the way Palladino will speak in the coming months will will reveal that. Yeah. Um, and we'll see what happens to him at the end of the season as well, because he's a very good manager. Yeah, he is. He is, and, and he has them playing a nice brand of football. <coughs> However, this loss marks Monza's sixth in Serie A this season. Yeah. Um, naturally, lest we forget, this is their second season in Serie A. Ever. <laughs> Ever. Um, and and they're doing all right. Yeah. They're, they're, they're doing fine. And keep in mind that last season, they managed to finish quite high up when they had a dreadful start to the season, bro. Yeah, yeah. They were in the opening seven matches. We were saying they're potentially the worst team in the league <laughs> at the moment. We said that they'd pick up so on and so forth. But they've had a better start than yeah. they did then. So they could even they, they, they could aim for, for top 10, you know? Absolutely. That's because Berlusconi had um, decided to... To stick with the manager who, <coughs> sorry about that, who yeah. promoted them, who got them promoted through the playoffs. I yeah. can't quite remember his name at the moment. No, not even me. Um, however, then Paladino took over as an interim manager and proved to be mm-hmm. a very good candidate to remain. And on he has stayed, the Monza are building something beautiful. So yeah. let's not let that distract us. Yep, well said. Monza are in 11th on 21 points, whilst Fiorentina are in 5th on 30 points, just one point behind Bologna. Lazio took on Empoli away from home and won 2-0. Hmm. And this was a pivotal away victory um, for them because they were on a two-month winless streak on the road, Lazio. Whoa. Yeah, yeah. Um, they were missing... Uh, well, not they were missing. Um, two key players fell injured during the game, Immobile and Luis Alberto. And this obviously affected the continuity of the game. Mm. But they managed to, to prevail and to do well, of course. So Empoli were missing their hitman Caputo up front. While Lazio were missing Lazzari and Romagnoli coming into this game. It was a 4-3-3 against a 4-3-3. And Lazio started the game quite assertively. And Gwenduzi broke the deadlock just nine minutes in. Capitalizing on a chaotic goal mouth scramble. Which involved <laughs> Luis Alberto's shot being cleared off the line by Luperto. <clears throat> okay, then Lazio and the Mobile fell injured in the 22nd and the 25th minute. Um, leading to substitutions, um, they brought on, well, Sarri brought on Camarda, Camarda and Castellanos. I was going to call it Camarda, Camarda. Dude. It happens to me so yeah, much, bro. It was throwing an R there. Um, I want to talk about both these, Camarda and Castellanos, not because they did anything, but because of two observations. I'll mention them okay. later on. So Empoli um, seized the chance to mount a comeback, pressuring Lazio's defense, but Providel incredible saves and stopped them from equalizing he was a wall this game yeah so far score gave him an 8.9 rating for go. a goalkeeper he was incredible so second half his heroics continued um, he denied Cambiaghi Maldini Fazzini by the way I did not know Maldini was this good he was very Maldini good had game. a very, very good impressive. game he had a very good game he's very involved in this yeah. game the second goal came in the 67th minute through Mattias Zaccani and it took his third attempt Third rebound yeah. to score. Um, and if you just watch Kamada on the line, was thrilled, huh? <laughs> you can see that he doesn't even smile, he doesn't even blink, he doesn't even react when Zakani scores that goal. He it's doesn't stop mewing like weird. It's we it's it's weird. Like not even a yes. Yeah, nothing. Not nothing. Even a fuck. No reaction. Yeah, let's go. No not reaction. Zero. Zero. Super, super Almost strange. like that Maltese TikToker that eats really spicy food. Yeah. No reaction. No reaction. No, no reaction. reaction. <laughs> it's Kamada. That's Kamada. No reaction to Zakani's goal. Um, and yes, I wanted to highlight Castellanos because at the end of the game, he missed one on one and he fucking ruined the opportunity to make a pun that Castellanos scored at the Castellani. Oh my God. He needs to, to wait another entire season. So yes, expertly done by Lazio. I think that Provedel deserves a heap of praise over here because he was absolutely fantastic. Um, you look at um, Spalletti's job right now with Italy. 
He's got to choose between Di Gregorio, Vicario, Donnarumma and Provedel. He can only call up three. Who's he calling up? Say them again. Donnarumma, Provedel, Vicario, Di Gregorio. He will call up. And Meret, and Meret, and Meret, sorry. What, what he will do. Yeah. Me- Meret, no. He's, he's not that good this season. He'll, but Spalletti he'll... knows him from Napoli. Yeah. But fuck that, <laughs> right? This isn't a, a friend business, what? He's going to call up Donnarumma, Vicario, Prevedel. I think he should call up Donnarumma, Vicario, Di Gregorio. Donnarumma, Vicario, Di Gregorio. That's what I yeah. think. But yeah, he'll call up Prevedel. He'll call up Meret. For sure, he'll call up Meret. You see, yes. Of course, of course. Yeah, but God forbid. I mean, Meret really hasn't been special this season. I mean... He's been okay. He's Nothing been crazy. nowhere on the other ones' it's levels. True, it's nowhere, true, it's true. nowhere it's near. True. But yeah, I, I still think he'll call him up. But yeah, um, as per the standings, let's give him a sec, guys. Don't worry. Empoli sit in nineteenth with twelve points, while Lazio sit in ninth with twenty-four points. Sassuolo one, Genoa two. <laughs> Can we call this a relegation battle? I, yeah, you can. I, I guess. Why not? Um, Genoa secured a crucial comeback in this game, winning 2-1. Uh, Sassuolo faced defensive issues, continuing their trend of conceding in every match this season. Sassuolo haven't kept a clean sheet this season. Genoa's Retegui, Messias and Kutlu were unavailable, while Sassuolo missed Berardi, Defrel, Viti, Ra- Rakic... Uh, Agustin Alvarez and Pedro Obiang. Castillo started in place of Berardi and Ecuban started in place of Retegui. In the 28th minute, Pinamonti opened the scoring against his former team after a counter-attack led by Lauriante. The Frenchman did very well to break away but almost fucked it at the end due to a soft pass to Pinamonti, uh, putting the striker under bags of pressure from Genoa's backtracking defenders. Pinamonti did well, although Dragosin did manage to get a significant touch. By the way, Sassuolo have some new fans. <laughs> <laughs> they, they took a bunch of school kids out, which is, which is such a smart thing to do. It's a great thing to do, their first cultural experience, because Sassuolo really secures a couple of fans for the future, but it was hilarious. You see Milan's fans with the curva fucking chanting like a bunch of army men. And then you see when Sassuolo score, yeah! There's just it's a bunch like, of kids like celebrating. You have the players celebrating. And it pans to the crowd and their children in oh, green hats. Yeah. <laughs> they were losing their minds. I understand. They were, they were it was fight. hilarious. It was fucking funny, man. Go on, watch it, guys. It's like what you don't expect to see. Like when the camera hey. pans to the fans and their children. I do think it's a good idea to, yeah, to get some kids course. involved. Um, in the 44th minute, Martinez denied Henrique brilliantly following a square pass by Lauriante from the byline. In the 55th minute, Consigli denied Goodmanson in a 1v1 scenario. Great save by Consigli. In the 63rd minute, Goodmanson scored from the spot following um, VAR spotting a clumsy Ehrlich handball in the box. His hand was up when the cross was coming in, so he essentially punched the ball in the air. Nice one, Ehrlich. <laughs> yeah. Possibly Ehrlich, who knows? Who, 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 I don't care. <laughs> I, don't I don't care <laughs> if it's Ehrlich or Ehrlich. Do you care if it's Simic or Simic? Yes. And it's Zimic. Zimic? Zimic. Never. Thank you, Lana. So with with Ehrlich or Ehrlich, you don't care? Bro, I've, have you seen him play? <laughs> In any of the three Sassuolo centre-backs, Ruan, Ehrlich and Ferrari, I don't care. I, I, I don't even want to talk about Sassuolo's defense. I don't. Because it's not even like they keep a man on side by accident or, or fucking, I, I don't know, they fail to make a tackle or they make a genuine mistake. But they're all like just clumsy, stupid fuck-ups every time. I don't know how anyone stands it. I don't know how Mintoff hasn't stopped supporting Sassuolo, because it's ridiculous, it's an illness, it's ingrained in them. Everyone that they get as a, as a centre-back is fucking up and fucking up and fucking up. As you, you put your hand up like that, a cross is coming in. <laughs> what is this, bro? <laughs> Season one, I had made a joke, oh, what is this, Pallon War? I thought it was one of them. Like, bro, it's the same shit. It's the same shit all the time with them. Dionisi must be the next manager of... Yes, let me just um, finish the play-by-play, 86th minute. 
Echo Ban banged in the winner after beating Ehrlich to the ball in a counter-attack and finishing powerfully into the bottom corner. That's his first goal in 19 I'm matches. I'm so happy for him, man. Hey, hey Echo Ban has been booed, good. man. It's his first goal since Bari. Madonna, scoring his Bari in a 4-3 victory last season. Madonna. Yeah, his first goal in 19 matches, literally. But he... Um, like he he assisted Goodmanson in the yeah. last game and he scored an important winner over here. It's it's obviously rare for a newly promoted team to get three points in the season, so Ekuban should be should be happy with that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And now they have Inter next, so let's see if Caleb can keep it up. Yeah, yeah. Are Sassuolo regressing the same way Verona were regressing a couple that's, of that's seasons very ago? That's interesting. Um, I think they're investing more. Granted, um, it's nothing spectacular, but they are bringing in players. Hellas Verona. Didn't really make any investments, and now news has come out that they're facing bra- bankruptcy. It's not looking mm-hmm. good for them at all. They were selling and selling and selling, and just weakening and weakening and weakening. So, Swallow, granted, are, are not as strong as they once were, but the players they have are young and do have a good markup value. The worst thing that could happen to Swallow right now is relegation, and yeah. they have to sell these fucking players that they invested in on a cheap price. For, e- for exactly, a cheap. exactly. Um, Honestly, they, they need to see what they're going to do. I think they need a new manager, personally. I, I, I do think that they need a new manager. Will that save them? I think they have a good enough team um, to be mm-hmm. saved. The same way Verona had a good team two seasons ago, though. And then you look at this squad that they have, and it's unrecognizable. And I do think that that could really happen with, mm-hmm. with Sassuolo. They could fall off and fall off and fall off. And it's not like they're an incredibly marketed team with a lot of appeal for people to join. Um, so I think Sassuolo are regressing into a Serie B team again, yeah. slowly, slowly. Sorry if you've mentioned this already. Where was Berardi? Injured. Flu. Flu? Mm, in January. Convenient. Convenient. Huh? Very convenient. convenient. Um, Pinamonte this season has been better. Yeah. Thumbs up and smiley face. <laughs> He's actually been himself yeah, for Sassuolo. Yeah. He has been a, 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 a bright point for them. And Genoa, props to their counter-attacking football, man. On the break, they are fucking dangerous. They could hold their own. They hit you on the break, and they could get you. Sassuolo are in 15th place on 16 points. They're three points ahead of 18th place Cagliari. While Genoa are in 13th place on 19 points. Yeah. Um, Hellas Verona beat Cagliari 2-0. Um, I was not expecting that. I know, right? Verona, Verona of course, were missing Faroni, Hrustic and Serdar, while Cagliari were missing Rog, Shomorodov and Capradossi. Um, basically, look, this is how the game went. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna give to give you the raw version. Okay, so it's my favorite the game version. started and Cagliari were all over them. They were wasteful, but they were dominant, right? They were all over Hellas Verona, and the game was only looking to go one way. Uh, in the 51st minute, Makumbu, Antoine Makumbu, gets his second yellow card and is sent off. Bravo. In the 53rd minute, just two minutes later, Cyril Ngonj hits on the break and scores, right? At this point, <clears throat> in the 59th minute, Ranieri decides to bring on Luvumbo. To try to do something. But because of the fact that he benches Luvumbo to start the game. And we actually praise this decision, right? You bring Mm. him on when everyone's tired and he's even better than he would genuinely be. In this game, it showed that he was wasted. Because Mm. had you started off the game when Cagliari were piling up that pressure and you had a player like Zito Luvumbo over there, you would have got a goal in the first half, for sure. For sure. But the problem is, in the second half, you got a red card and then you brought him on. So it's a waste. It's a waste, you know. You're, you're playing a man down and, and your best players come on. He has to do the running for two people. So it's not actually an advantage. I'm not a massive fan of, of keeping tricks up your sleeve and, and, and doing this and that. I think in a game against Verona, maybe you do that against Inter, for example. Mm. Keep something up your sleeve. Um, and, and then shock because you need to do something special against mm-hmm. the, the bigger teams. Um, but against Verona, you get a goal in the first half courtesy of, of Zito Luvumbo or you get a couple of goals in the first half and, and that's game one. I think he just wanted to introduce a gear in the second half that Hellas Verona literally didn't have. Yeah, fair that's enough. That's it. But yeah, it, it bit him in the ass, definitely. Um it was impressive how Cagliari started the game, though. The, all they were lacking was the goal. They were playing really well. Um, and VAR, they did actually score, but VAR is allowed it for offside. Okay, it was goal done. Mm. Um, yeah. Um, Juric, and then eventually later on, he missed the header. It was well saved by Scuffet, who looks like Cranio. I always say that. 
Um, <laughs> and then later on, um, Umbula did really well driving down the wing. He chopped inside, played the ball to Juric, who calmly placed it into the bottom corner for Hellas Verona to beat Cagliari 2-0. Yeah, big win for Verona, man. Massive, Verona, massive, we're massive. in need of this. And then a relegation six point. Are you kidding me, man? Super important victory for them. Yes, and they currently find themselves in 16th with 14 points, while Cagliari are down 18th with 13 points. The relegation battle has intensified, and in January, we'll get a clear idea of what's going to happen. Yep, yep. Uh, Torino 1, Udinese 1 uh, Torino had Bellanova, Linetti, Inguessan and Shures out injured Udinese, I feel like they've had the same fucking 7 players out injured for the entire season Bijol, Brenner, Davis, De La Feu, Bosse and Semedo um, Payero naturally suspended after he got a red card in the last match against Sassuolo in the 2-2 draw Um Early attempts, uh, Torino initiated several attacks early on. They they started the game off way stronger than Udinese. Um, the, the Zapata Sanabria thing up front is proving to be super effective. I think it gives Torino some flair and it gives them a lot of muscle up mm-hmm. front. And 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 yeah, it's 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 working pretty well. Uh, Silvestri made a crucial save on Vlasic's attempt in the fourth minute. Uh, there were chances for both teams throughout the match, but both teams struggled to break through each other's lines of defence. Illich had some shots from distance, but nothing to write home about. Uh, Udinese took a shock lead through substitute Zarraga in the 80th minute, capitalising on a defensive lapse. Zarraga's cushioned volley off Ferreira's cross went through the gloves of Vanya and into the back of the net. Could the keeper have done better? My opinion Yes, uh, I don't think it should go down as an error, as certain articles uh, said it was when it's that fucking close mm-hmm. to the to goal. You can't ask for much. Um, in a twist of fate, Illich's Tiro cross looped over Silvestri in the 88th minute, leading to Torino's late equaliser. The goal, although possibly unintentional, secured a deserved draw for Torino. Um, throughout this game, I do think that Torino were significantly better than Udinese and I think they deserved much more from this game um, it's just that finishing touch sometimes despite having those two strikers up front for them um, isn't there for Torino like they dominated possession 65% uh, ball possession um, but to be honest man props to Udinese's defense they had, a, they had a very it's, good game it's a combination of two things right it's the same problem that Torino have faced all season um, which Juric admitted to the fact that there's a missing piece and his side can't seem to get the goals they need to close games out um, and on the other hand you have Udinese who proved to be such a compact side and so good at getting draws man so yeah. it was never going to be this had draw written all over it from the game yeah yeah Torino Udinese yeah. that, that yeah. like you probably put a draw on that yeah. knowing, <laughs> knowing you and yeah. your yeah you know me bro you know me baby you know how it is yeah um, but honestly props to uh, the defence of Udinese uh, with, with Joao Ferreira Newen Perez and Thomas Christensen they did put in a very solid performance over there. They weren't giving Duvan Zapata fucking any space, time or anything. They were on him like yeah. the plague. Dude, um, one point I wanted to make about Udinese. Mm-hmm. I think they should go for a 4-3-3 manager. They have so many technically gifted players. True. They've got Lorenzo Luca up front, man. You've got the likes of Pereira, Samar Zic, you know. Honestly, I think it could work. I think it's good work. Yeah, it seems like aha. Uh-huh. Oh, you you you're probably right. I agree with you there. Four three three. Mm-hmm. Pereira out on the right. I'm not quite sure who they'll have as a as a left winger. Let's see one second. Ah, they, well, they will have it eventually. <laughs> Tovon, Tovon, Tovon. They, can play. they have many te- technically Isaac gifted success. players. They even have Pafundi, Simone Pafundi, seventeen Pafundi. years old. He's very creative. Oh. Like, put him out there. Why not? And then you have the likes of you know you can easily find three midfielders over here. Yeah, but I think what what Udinese want to do over here with this three at the back, this is this isn't an inter three at the back. You know what I mean? This is fucking defensive city with course, three center backs. Like this is we don't want to do anything. We just want to play in Serie A. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's where Udinese are right now. How crazy when you think about it, man. A year ago today they had that start to the season that they did, and now <laughs> yeah. they find themselves in this the situation. Fell, bro. My, my god, literally, bro. It's the Ola so film. important. He can be so good when he's fit. I just wonder if he'll ever be the same again. 
I mean, at that age, following all those injuries, how old is Della Fell now? He's he not must, even that old, but he's must got, be 34, he, you know? He's, he's weak from his injuries. What man. the he's, fuck? He said it himself. He's, he's 29. Yeah, yeah, he's, only, he's not old, bro. Um, he just has a terrible injury record, man. And it's really hindering his career. They're struggling with Dinez, I mean, they're in 17th, bro, on 14 points, one point above Cagliari in 18th. Hot dog. Hot hot diggity dog. They're going to need to rack up some points if they're going to want to <laughs> survive the season. There are some new contenders for relegation that there weren't yeah. last year, this it's year. Here. And Sassuolo and Udinese. Hear me now. Mm. Sassuolo and Udinese. Um, I don't think either of them would get promoted. Oh, demoted, sorry, relegated rather. I uh, thought you said hear me now because you had a point. To no, me. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> hear me now to gas you up as your hype man. Uh. Um... No, I, I don't think either of them would get prom- would get no, relegated. I, mean, I keep saying promoted. But they're, they're contenders. So think about how Verona became contenders for relegation over the past two seasons. Yeah. Um, no, the teams are regressing. You're absolutely right. You, you, you're spot on. Um, they're worsening every year. And Sassuolo, for example, considering their economic power, because they yeah. have sold players for very high prices, you know, yeah. Scamacca, Raspadori, mm-hmm. Politano like it's endless this is endless of players you, there are many we're forgetting as well Frattesi you mm-hmm. know um, so yeah um, it's just the lack of reinvestment or rather reinvesting a little bit too much in young talent maybe and yeah. not addressing the the defensive issues yep I think you're you're absolutely right over there and a couple of teams are falling victim to that um, you know what we did forget to mention ah uh. That fucking Ricardo Saponara started the game of football. Ah, yes, he started he the started. game for Verona. He started. And he was all right. Um, Ngonj and Duda were, to be honest, statistically much better than him. <laughs> he didn't really do much, but it's a good start for Saponara. You know, let's get yeah. going. Let's get yeah. going. Yeah, he just needs more playing time, man. Yeah. How is he supposed to perform when he hasn't even been on the pitch this season? Um Torino are in 10th on 24th place. That's so Torino. <laughs> um, Udinese 17th on 14 points. Yep, new relegation contenders. Yes, guys, we have been Serie A Spotlight. Thank you very much for listening, as always. Um, if you've made it this far, especially, remember to do what you have to do. Like, rate, date, chat. Exactly. And we will see you all. Probably in a few days' time for a listener. Yeah, episode. for the listener questions. Yeah, we'll do that. Yeah. We'll do that very soon. In the meantime, if you're going out for New Year's Eve and I see one of you driving, shame on you. Shame on you. Shame on you. That's how people die. Yeah. Okay. Who do you think you are? Balotelli, Nyang? Mm. You're not Balotelli. You're not Nyang. Nyang is playing in Turkey, by the way. Really? Yes. All right. How's he doing? I mean, a football manager kicked my ass. I'm not <laughs> <laughs> I was doing good in real life. But anyway, yes, guys, stay safe throughout this very fun period. Enjoy it and don't be too crazy. Love you all. We'll see you soon. All the best. This is Serie Spotlight. If you like Serie A or have ever liked it in the past, it's a good opportunity for you to listen once a week and you'll get filled in. In the football weekend, that's like the main dish. But then a few days later, you drop your episode and that's like the dessert. And the dessert is just perfect. It's good, the cake. It makes it feel like we're all sitting in a room together, just BSing with each other. The atmosphere is fantastic. I promise nobody will ask you to send boob pics. Sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. I love how you go into so much detail and show so much passion towards each and every team. Literally, no team is left undiscussed. When I listen to you, it's like I'm talking to you in a pub. It's like I'm chatting to a friend and you're chatting to me.